Hello everyone. If you enjoy the story, please consider supporting the author by going to the link in the description to Amazon to pre-order the book for yourself. It costs 99 cents and it'll be out on April 20th for you to enjoy on any of your electronic devices. You probably think that all doctors are filthy rich because I sure as hell did in the beginning. Eight years and a fistful of premature gray hairs later, I'm just a few hundred thousand dollars poorer than broke. That would matter if I had a family to provide for, but the long hours in med school have led to an end of my last relationship and a countdown on the shelf life of my ovaries. I was in a take what I can get and be grateful situation. So when St. Francis Hospital in Charleston, West Virginia offered me a position, I packed my sad life into three bags and sought opportunity in the hills of the Appalachia. 19 of us started in July and 13 have since dropped out. I like to think of myself as the rat that wouldn't drown. Some people broke inside after watching children die because they weren't good enough doctors quite yet. Everyone has to be a rookie at some point. It's doubly hard when you have to inform the dead child's parents, who then beg you to tell them different news or scream that they want to die and just please kill them with whatever drug takes away the pain. But most of my incoming class couldn't handle the chief of medicine. Dr. Vivian Scritt is, without a doubt, the biggest bitch I have ever met. Now I know why. Nineteen of you start today, and we've got a pool going with bets on how long each of you will last, she told us on day one. Don't feel any pressure, folks. I've talked with each of you in private, and my expectations are very low. She peered condescendingly over her thin spectacles, snorted, then turned around to walk away. You should know when to follow me and when to stay away, because I'm not going to waste time explaining what you should figure out on your own. We gawked at one another, all feeling weak and small, then scampered after her. I was last in line and felt out of place taking even that much. You should have a list of expectations for St. Francis, Dr. Scritt explained as she walked on, not bothering to look at us as she talked. I printed 18 sheets of rules so that you would have to challenge one another for them knowing that one of you will be left behind. An icy cold settled in the pit of my stomach as I saw everyone look down a list of rules that only I did not have. If you cannot follow these rules, there will be no place for you in this hospital. It most likely means that you are unsuited to be a doctor and should consider a profession that demands a weaker mental aptitude. At that, she turned around to face us all. And if you think I'm the type to give second chances after a mistake, you're woefully unprepared for the world of medicine. She stopped and looked at each of us in turn, apparently expecting a response that no one dared to offer. Well, she shot out in exasperation. Why are you all standing here? People are dying. Get to work! No one wanted to show me their list of rules, so I had to wait until one of my classmates died. It took nearly a week. I was working at 3 a.m. because I had only been on the clock for 10 hours. I was rushing into another room so that a patient wouldn't know I was googling his symptoms. Doctors do this far more than you realize, and I saw Myron by himself in an OR. I stopped immediately. Myron? I squeaked. What the hell is that? His arms were working furiously, but his back was turned to me, so I couldn't see what he was doing. Something felt wrong. Myron was the pick of our litter. He'd been top ten in his class at John Hopkins, and he would remind us of that fact in exchange for answering the questions that we were too terrified to ask Dr. Scritt. Slowly, I approached Myron, not wanting to startle him. We're really busy right now. Is there something you need help with? He showed no outward signs that he'd heard me. Instead, he kept pumping away furiously at the task at hand. When I was five steps from him, I could see drops of blood flying over his shoulder which made no sense since he had been alone in the room. Myron, I whispered, barely loudly enough to hear my own words. I slowly crept around his left side, finally bringing the scene into full view. Myron's abdomen was split from sternum to pelvis. His esophagus spilled out and his stomach sat on the table. A nest of quivering small intestine led from the bottom of his stomach back into his shredded torso. Myron showed no outward signs of pain. He was too busy working. He clutched his own stomach tightly in his left hand, the folds of squirting through his fingers like unbaked bread. His right hand was working furiously with a scalpel, sawing his organ into ribbons. Rivers of sweat poured down his forehead with the intensity of the effort. 
I tried to scream, but it only came out as a moan. That was enough to get Myron to notice me. Slowly, he raised his hand. Slowly, he smiled. It was not a happy smile. With eye contact locked on me, he licked his lips, angrily stabbed a piece of his stomach, and lifted it to his mouth. He bit. He chewed. Then, he lunged. But most people don't know how to move with their innards splayed out for all the world to see. And this was his downfall. Myron's tattered guts caught on the corner of the table, and he fell to the floor. Finally, he started screaming. I learned very early in my medical career that compartmentalization is indispensable. That instinct took over my brain in the moment, and I acted clinically. Myron was still grasping his scalpel with his right hand. I kicked it, hard, and it flew out of his hands. He stared at me and screeched. With his entrails still wrapped around the table, I figured my best option was to retreat. I moved to the back of the room as a doctor and a janitor burst in. And in possibly the most shocking moment of the night, I realized that they were not shocked. Myron was anesthetized, subdued, and extracted within a minute of their arrival. For a moment, I was alone with a pool of blood and diced stomach lining. And something else. A sheet of paper lay on the floor, its corner just touching the edge of the creeping blood. Myron had dropped his list of rules. The practical part of my brain continued to drive me. I snatched the paper from the ground and quickly exited the room, taking care to avoid the puddle. I didn't want to leave any bloody footprints in my wake. I knew that I had to read the list as soon as I was able to find 30 uninterrupted seconds to myself. Three hours later, I had my opportunity and ducked into a janitor's closet. With a shaking, exhausted hand, I pulled the chain on a bare bulb, tried to ignore the noxious smell of leaking ammonia, and read, St. Francis Hospital Rules, Guidelines for New Doctors. 1. Never, under any circumstances, share your copy of the rules with anyone else. 2. If any other doctor displays erratic behavior, leave the area immediately. Do not make eye contact. 3. If any other doctor is approached or detained by someone in a janitor's uniform, do not interfere. Never ask about that former doctor again. 4. Never touch any seemingly abandoned Reese's peanut butter cups. Those are Dr. Scrit's favorite candy. 5. Any child that dies in St. Francis Hospital must be cremated within 120 minutes of the official time of death. If you suspect this rule has been broken, alert Dr. Scrit and the hospital will be evacuated. 6. There is no children's burn unit at St. Francis Hospital. If you find yourself there, continue walking until you return to familiar territory. This usually requires traveling in a straight line down the central hallway for 47 minutes. You will not reach a wall during that interval. 7. This rule is on a need-to-know basis. 8. A small quantity of sulfuric acid is kept in every room. This is only intended for the use on patients with severed spinal cords. If they attack, a hypodermic injection of H2SO4 into the cranium is the only way to subdue the subject. 9. The morgue must house at least 13 cadavers at all times. 10. If you find yourself on the hospital roof with no memory of how you got there, you have only two choices. Either wait for an extraction team to find you, or jump four stories to the sidewalk on Court Street. 11. If you see room 1913, do not look directly at the numbers. Do not open the door. This is by far the most important rule. My heart stopped when the door opened. Dr. Scrit was staring at me. What little emotions shined through her exterior seemed to be surprise. We both stood, frozen, for five seconds of agonized silence. Dr. Fellis, she drawled gravely. I'm shocked. She stared down at the bloodstained list of rules in my hand. I reached for words, any words, because literally any response would make me look less guilty than I did in that moment, staring up at my boss's boss's boss and saying literally nothing in my defense as she weighed my soul with her eyes. And I said nothing. You took a list that wasn't yours and were nowhere to be found after your co-worker experienced such an unnatural incident. Dr. Scrit huffed through her nose. It seems you're willing to do the unthinkable in the name of getting what you need. And Myron couldn't even follow the most important rule. She clenched her teeth. 
I had a four-year streak of predicting when incoming doctors will break the soonest. This will ruin my chances in the office pool. The ghost of a smile graced her lips before she turned to leave. Get to work, doctor. You've got three hours left on your shift, and those symptoms aren't going to Google themselves. I didn't realize that I'd been holding my breath until I heard my own gasp for air. Shaking, I slowly emerged from the janitor's closet. I quickly stuffed the list of rules back into my pocket, reflecting on the fact that I had just achieved what might be considered an actual win. Perhaps, just maybe, I would keep my head above water at St. Francis after all. I turned to head down the hall when I stopped in my tracks. Everything was unfamiliar. What the hell had happened? I glanced all around. The design of the hallway was familiar, but everything was off. I could hear people talking in the rooms, but the immediate vicinity was devoid of all people but myself. Nothing made sense. Then I looked up. And I'll be honest, I peed a little when I read the sign. St. Francis Hospital, Children's Burn Unit. I kept my head down and my ears up as I traveled the center corridor of the children's burn unit of St. Francis Hospital. This hospital doesn't have a children's burn unit. Even though I passed by a sign that proudly claimed it had been donated by the Friends of Cresswell Academy for superb children. Nope. This place didn't exist. I'd been working for St. Francis since July, and I knew every square inch of it. Maybe there was a wing that I'd missed, right? But after advancing in a straight line for several minutes, I knew that was nonsense. I didn't go around any corners or encounter any walls. I certainly would have noticed a half-mile hallway if it were real. The people were off as well. There was a heavy-set nurse with frizzy hair who stared with distrust as I passed. I encountered her three different times along the same corridor, despite the fact that she could not possibly have moved ahead of me. Another nurse, frail and nervous-looking, tried to hand me a bag of blood. When I refused, she threw it angrily on the ground, where it splattered. I kept walking without looking back. My list of rules had been very clear about the fact that I was to continue in a straight line for 47 minutes if I found myself in this impossible place. I glanced down at my watch. It was 3.09 a.m., six minutes since I'd arrived in this impossible corner of hell. The employees became more insistent as I walked on. Doctor! A resident yelled at me as he jumped out of a room. The patient is coding. We need you stat. I carefully avoided eye contact as I moved past him. Doctor! He screamed. You're killing her! I wiped away a tear as I continued forward, ignoring the unholy scream that came from the room. I'd heard enough patients to know what a death wail sounds like, but I had no choice. A minute later, I came across a pool of standing blood. It reached across to both walls of the hallway and stretched twenty feet in front of me. As I watched, I could see it growing. A surly-looking man in a janitor's uniform stood by, arms crossed, staring at me. I didn't think he was actually a janitor. Without slowing down, I plodded through the blood. Damn, these were my favorite pair of Crocs. I entered a clear path of hallway and checked my watch. It was 3.22. I'd been walking for 19 minutes, which was 13 longer than I'd last checked. The newfound quiet was more unnerving than the blood had been. Then, slowly, I could feel tension growing in the air. Imagine a strange man standing two inches behind you, who you can smell but not see as his breath warms the back of your neck. That kind of tension was coming from the room ahead. Slowly, the door came into view. I could see the numbers 191 before I closed my eyes. I kept them shut tight as I went by. Vertigo nearly sent me tumbling as I passed the door. I didn't care about the possibility of walking into a wall. I kept my eyes closed for a long time after that. Miraculously, I didn't hit anything. When I finally opened them again, it was 327. 24 minutes to go. That's when a hand tugged at my back. Can you please help me? squeaked a terrified voice from behind. I stopped walking. I considered my options. Then I continued forward. Wait! They cried. Please, I'm really hurt and I need your help. They grabbed my shirt again and started crying. I wiped both eyes and moved onward. The greatest challenges make us grow, but that feat is achieved through forcing some small part of us to die. 
Children only have the energy and drive to play outside because the world hasn't yet extracted its inevitable due. I knew that I had to obey the rules, but doing so killed a little piece of my soul. I'd become a doctor because I had believed that I could give all of me to a cause and kept getting out of bed each day without a diminished sense of purpose. But as I listened to the child walk behind me, crying loudly and begging for help, I accepted the fact that part of me was never coming out of that godforsaken burn unit. I passed the heavy set nurse again. Her eyes bulged as she saw the boy. Doctor! She yelled. You need to help that child! I walked past without acknowledging her. Doctor! She screamed. What is wrong with you? I ignored her in the same way that I dismissed all the nurses, doctors, and patients who gawked at the boy in my wake. No matter what they shouted, I pretended not to hear them as I moved onward. What happened to him? Him? What happened to her? Why would anyone ignore a child in that state? Should we help him? No, the boy is her responsibility. The tears wouldn't stop, no matter how many times I wiped my face. I passed a doctor and another janitor. I recognized them as people who had extracted Myron from the OR. They stared, arms folded, judging me as I went by. Figures, the doctor explained to the silent janitor. She wasn't there for her brother either. I broke. I let my body double over and cried openly. Deep, ugly sobs heaved from my diaphragm, convulsing my frame as my mind teetered on the edge. But I didn't stop walking. Doctors can compartmentalize when facing issues of life and death, and my life depended on constant movement. The boy clutched my shirt as I wailed, and we walked. For no less than three miles, I endured the most bizarre trial of my life. A sudden change in the acoustics prompted me to look at my watch. 3.51 a.m. 47 minutes had passed. I allowed one final shuddering <laughs> sob, and then I stopped to look around. I was in familiar territory. The first friendly face was Lydia, a nurse that I knew was from this world. I wanted to wrap her in a bear hug and scream in delight. She stared at me, her face contorted in horror. What the fuck is that thing behind you? My body temperature surely dropped five degrees as I felt a familiar tugging on my shirt. I froze. Panicked footsteps came rushing my way. I stared in their direction instead of looking behind me. Dr. Scrit was in a full sprint. Dr. Aphalus! She yelled. She was the consummate bitch, but in that moment, I wanted to see her more than anyone else on this earth. It's been 47 minutes! I heaved in a shaking breath. Should I look at it? Dr. Scrit stopped a few steps away from me. Gravely, she nodded. I swallowed, then slowly turned around. I told myself that nothing is ever as bad as we picture it because reality is bound by rules that imagination is not. I was wrong. Imagine a pizza with the cheese stripped off, a lumpy mass of marinara that is occasionally interrupted by chunks of sizzling meat that sit atop a mound of globby, yeasty dough. Now imagine that the pizza is a person. That person is a child, and one eyeball is hanging from an empty socket. And that child has no hair, because all the skin is gone from his scalp and that he has a gaping hole where a nose used to be. Help me, he whispered. Help. His jaw fell to the floor, scattering teeth in every direction. The boy's tongue dangled from his open throat, flopping aimlessly like a dying fish. Then he squeezed my arm in a vice-like grip, screamed, and fell to the ground. I looked down at the motionless glob of flesh that had once been a child. Dr. Scrit, I breathed. Is he... Don't be an idiot, Dr. Aphalus. He was dead long before you brought him here. I stared at her in sudden realization. Like, more than 120 minutes before? Did your inane chatter suddenly achieve the ability to carry a body to the morgue, Dr. Aphalus? She asked as she bent over the corpse. Um, I'll, f I'll find a gurney. No one signs up to be a doctor because she's afraid of getting blood on her manicure. She snapped as she lifted the boy's shoulders. Grab the damn legs and let's hope his body has more structural integrity than Jello. This cadaver's not going to walk itself to the crematorium. Dazedly, I bent down and picked up the boy's ankles. 
My stomach turned as his skin shifted under my grip like the flesh of barbecued chicken. Compartmentalize. Lydia held the door open for us as we carried the boy down the stairs, through the morgue, and into a corner where I'd never needed to venture. I knew that the incinerator was there, but I had no reason to use it. It's too small to fit his body inside, I explained as I gasped for air. Dr. Scrit was clearly in amazing shape. She'd nearly sprinted across the morgue, and I'd struggled to keep pace while hauling the body. Why can't we... She grunted as she snatched the corpse from me and shoved his feet inside the incinerator. If you're going to bore me to death with ridiculous conversation, Dr. Ophelis, then hurry up and make sure I'm dead before 120 minutes is up. Either that, or fucking help me! It's amazing what we're capable of doing when an imposing figure informs us that we have no choice. Side by side, we forced the boy's body into the narrow opening of the incinerator. When he got stuck, we just pushed harder, both of us groaning with effort as his charred, melting flesh slowed off like the skin of a rotting peach. Lumps of meat dropped to the floor as we peeled layers off the boy. But he was going in. We were pushing his shoulders through when his eye opened. No textbook could have prepared me for the moment that I stood shoulder to shoulder with the chief of medicine, forcing the decaying body of a charred kid into the incinerator as his one functioning eye glared back at us in hateful judgment. He was wedged in the narrow door at the shoulders, with only his head sticking out into the room with us. His jaw had long since fallen off, and the rotting tongue danced above his inverted face like a charmed snake. Dr. Scrit, I whispered in a quavering voice. What are we supposed to do? We're bound by Premum Nam No Shir, so don't we have to? You're bound by helping the living, Dr. Ophelis, which includes me and possibly yourself if you help me out right fucking now. She grunted this while moving her hands to the top of the boy's head. As she pushed, the entirety of his scalp slid off like a flaky scab ripped from a wounded leg. A fresh, clean white skull shined from underneath as the boy's torn skin dropped to the floor like so much ground beef. They're easier to grab without the skin. Push down on its head. Then she batted his tongue away like an annoying fly and pressed deeply into his shoulders. Her fingers disappeared into his flesh like a boot into thick mud. Dazed, I pushed against the boy's exposed bone. I was shocked to realize how cold it was and how it twitched as he fruitlessly tried to bite me with a jaw that didn't exist. I hate to give away the ending of this story, but you're going to be real surprised with what this thing can do in about 10 seconds if you continue fondling it with the restrained intensity reserved for jerking off an octogenarian. Push! She yelled as she leaned in. The body slid into the incinerator with the gentle resistance of a bowel movement. Once in, the boy screamed. Dr. Scritch shoved me violently aside, slammed the padlock into place, and spun the dial. I looked back at her in shock. She was a bitch, for certain, but she'd never touched me before. Still, I was a first-year intern. The chief of medicine could pretty much force me to eat pus and call it ice cream. Dr. Scrit, I said shakily. Why did you put a padlock on the incin- The shrieking from beyond the lock was loud enough to shake the floor. Turn it on! She commanded me. Where are the- she pushed me away once more and frantically clutched at a series of buttons that had been behind me. Dr. Scrit! I yelled in response to the shove. Why are you- The padlock bounced as the incinerator door was hit from the inside. A chill settled over my body even as the temperature grew noticeably warmer. This is a custom incinerator, Dr. Scrit explained as she grabbed my arm and pulled me away from the door. It will heat up very quickly, so stand- Pounding from inside the incinerator grew more forceful. I actually wondered if the padlock would hold. It flailed wildly back and forth with rhythmic hitting. It's at 200 degrees! Dr. Scrit called as she looked towards the gauge. We needed to go to 2000! My head swam. Most medical incinerators can't even get that hot! Dr. Scrit turned to face me. You're right, most can't. She looked back. 500 degrees. I gaped at her. Is it really heating that quickly? Can't you feel the change in the room? For the first time, I realized I was sweating profusely. How am I this hot? We're standing ten feet away. So we'd better back up, she continued. Eleven hundred degrees. 
With a light tinkling, a tiny screw fell to the floor and rolled away. Dr. Scrit? I breathed quietly. I know, you're sorry that it took you so long to get the boy here. She paused. We're all sorry. <laughs> Dr. Scrit, th the door to the incinerator, 1500 degrees. A wave of heat squeezed fresh sweat from every pore. I, I don't know if it'll hold. 1700 degrees. The padlock is bending. The metal will melt. That's why we keep hundreds of padlocks in reserve. We both stopped breathing. A hand-shaped indentation had slammed into the metal, warping it from the inside and leaving a seemingly impossible mark. We waited. 1913 degrees. We waited longer. Nothing happened. Sweat stung my eyes so badly that I couldn't see. When I wiped it away, I found that my arm was even saltier, rendering the pain worse. I think, Dr. Scrit uttered in a voice just above inaudible, that I stopped it. I stared through the shimmering heat waves radiating from the incinerator. Lumps of shorn flesh lay on the ground nearby. The smell of roasting carrion wafted through the air and gently tickled my gag reflex. I released the breath I had been unconsciously holding. So, we're safe? The door to the morgue slammed open and another intern sprinted inside. I recognized him as J.D., a nervous guy who looked like he was in perpetual shock. Dr. Scrit. He called across the room. It's Dr. Bretson. Rule 10. Despite the heat, a chill settled over the room that could have frozen my ash cheeks together. Prepare an OR! Now! She shot back authoritatively. He quickly disappeared. She turned to sprint out of the room. Dr. Scrit! I called back. She wheeled around to face me. W what should I do about the incinerator? She stared back like I had a dick instead of a nose. You should learn to know when things are dead, Dr. Ophelis. Enough haunts our lives without us carrying those who have left us behind. Then she turned around to rush out of the room. If you want to provide a modicum of usefulness, you can take a gurney out to Court Street. The roof is a long way from here. With that, she disappeared out of the door. What the fuck was Rule 10? My hand flew to my pocket. It was empty. Fuck, fuck, fuck. The list must have fallen out when I'd been hauling the human mush into the incinerator. I'd needed a classmate to die before I could see the list of rules, but once it was so easily accessible, I'd just taken it for granted. I swore to learn a lesson from this, and knew that I wouldn't. I'd read the rules once. Why would I need a gurney? I decided to sprint outside and find out what was happening first. The chilly night air latched onto my cold sweat, sending chills into every crevice of my body. I ran, and I saw nothing. There was no traffic. There were no people. I looked left, right, and left again. Then I looked up. Oh, shit. That was Rule 10. Dr. Brutson was standing a few feet from the edge of the roof. In the nearly full moon, I could see his body jittering like it was held by marionette strings. The entire scene was wrong. How and why could his limbs be moving like that? He was moaning softly. No, no, that wasn't it. He was crying. Nausea took hold of me as I realized that he was dancing closer and closer to the edge. I nearly collapsed as I remembered what the rule demanded. Either wait for an extraction team to find you, or jump four stories to the sidewalk on Court Street. Wait there! I screamed at him. Dr. Scrit is coming to get you! No, no, please! Brutson said, although I don't know whether he was talking to me. Don't make it angry! Make them go away! Hold on! I hollered back. You're almost safe. He wailed. I'm sorry, I tried to lock them out. P please, please don't do this. His body bounced and flailed like an electrified fish. I it was so bizarre, so wrong to watch this man jittering out of control in the rooftop moonlight that I nearly cried. A door on the roof slammed open with such intensity that I could hear it clearly on the ground below. No, no, please stay away. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Then he stepped away from the edge. I heaved an enormous sigh of relief. That relief evaporated when I realized he'd only moved back to allow space for a running start. I watched in horror as Dr. Brutson, my co-worker, my peer, ran forth and leapt into the night. 
He fell, arms and legs spinning, toward the concrete where I stood, four stories below. Being a doctor destroys the assumption that certain things are impossible. Most people carry around an unconscious belief that the human body is sacred in a way that protects it from an uncaring world. This is not true. Imagine the last object that broke unexpectedly. Did a dinner plate shatter into granules and shards when it slipped out of your soapy fingers? Perhaps you saw a watermelon roll off the grocery store display, splattering its fine, sticky goo across a ten-foot radius. A human body can do that. A person you love can be so damaged. Yet I hoped, perhaps foolishly, but still passionately, that whatever unnatural force had breathed into the corners of St. Francis would show mercy to Dr. Brutson as he flew to the ground. That was, of course, a stupid hope. The full moon illuminated each detail as he slammed against the cement with an ugly splat. His feet hit first, pathetically unable to reduce any momentum as his ankles bent and he undoubtedly shredded both Achilles' tendons. His knees followed crashing into the ground and shattering both patellas. Dr. Brutson's body pitched forward and fell all at once, with his head bouncing back like a rubber ball. A light spray of solid objects hit my ankles and I knew right away that his teeth had blown from his head like popcorn. For half a second, the night was still. Then, the convulsions began. I closed my eyes and took a slow, rattling breath. Compartmentalize. I could hear his torn, hollow cheeks flapping with the power of his spasms. Compartmentalize or someone else will pay for your failure. I opened my eyes. I dove to Dr. Brutson's side, taking in everything I could at once. Facial lacerations with severe hemorrhaging. Nothing apparent on the back of his head since the front absorbed the fall. Compound fracture of the spine, likely internal bleeding, likely fractures of both tibias. There was more, of course, but I had to check his breathing. Well, not really. I could hear his unholy gasps for air, and the spurts of blood told me that he had a pulse, but his artery, likely one of the subclavicans, was ruptured. That's not a good sign. I scrambled around his twitching body and pressed firmly on his upper back, stemming the geyser of blood. What the hell happened out here? A voice screamed from across the sidewalk. I look up to see Lydia being followed by one other nurse. They must have run outside after hearing the screaming and the splatting. I need a gurney and a neck brace stat. Prep an OR. We're going straight into surgery. I felt attached as I got to work. For a few moments, my hands moved of their own accord, following their implicit duties as the emotional part of my mind understood that it needed to drift away. It's your fault that no gurney is here. A little boy's voice whispered softly into my ear. We tell ourselves that there's nothing we could have done to take away someone else's hurt. That's usually a struggle to believe because it's usually not true. I didn't cry. I was too busy combating exsanguination while trying to avoid compromising the exposed spinal column of a convulsing man. You know that he's going to die. It won't happen right away. Will it be in ten minutes? Or twenty? The timbre of his voice, nearly musical, could have passed for any young child's teasing if it weren't for the years of sorrow running deep beneath his words. Lydia appeared with a team of nurses and J.D., the first intern who had alerted us to Brunson's rooftop stroll. I was still in charge, and I was still trying to save him. He's stable! Let's move! I ordered once we had gotten him onto the gurney. We met Dr. Scrit, who was running towards us as we rolled him into the hospital's front entrance. I met her eyes only once. It was enough to tell me just how bad I'd failed by ignoring her instructions to take the gurney outside with me. I took the judgment and pushed it deeply into my chest, allowing utter clinical focus on the task at hand. I knew, in a distant sort of way, that this failure would cut my mind in its deepest places once I had decompressed enough to examine my hurt. I would recover from it, but it would never be entirely whole again. Each mind is a tapestry of tattooed mental scars that are at once both public and invisible. The richest portraits tend to speak volumes in the silence between words. And most of us are paralyzingly afraid of hearing ourselves if we listen too closely. Monitorize the patient. Attach an ECG and the defibrillator. His convulsions had stopped. So had the blood spurts. What's his BP? 
Lydia looked closely. 140 over 100, she responded grimly. Where else is he bleeding from? His internal lacerations are worse than we thought. I, I can see the spinal cord. Patient isn't breathing. Get him intubated. His trachea is too damaged. BP is 170 over 130. 1713. He's still losing blood somewhere. We can't stop the internal bleeding. Patient's still not breathing. BP is 1913, doctor, Lydia explained softly. At those words, the heart monitor shot off an angry beeping noise. That's when his body convulsed once more as though every organ was sneezing simultaneously. Sudden capillary ruptures burst sprays of blood through his eyes, nose, ears, and broken mouth like a blood zit had exploded from within. We need to... Doctor. A voice cut through the din. I looked up to see Dr. Scrit looking expectantly at me, then at the clock on the wall. No, I didn't want to call time of death. As long as the work continued, I was able to avoid confronting emotions that I could domesticate but not tame. Dr. Scrit raised her eyebrows at me. I let out a soft breath of air. Time of death, 4.32 a.m. I'd like to see you privately, Dr. Ophelis. Okay, uh, I have to finish here and now. I don't know if Dr. Scrit had any unnatural powers of her own, but she had an undoubtedly uncanny ability to inform me of what I would be doing before I had consented to it, which is how I found myself trailing behind her on the journey to the office of the Chief of Medicine. I sat down across from her, promised myself that I wouldn't cry, then dried my eyes. She regarded me silently for a moment prior to speaking. Before you shed too many tears for yourself, Dr. Ophelis, remember that the impeding grief for Dr. Brutson's family will be far greater. The crying stopped. She let the silence linger for a moment longer. You didn't follow my instructions when I said you needed to produce a gurney. I swallowed. I'm sorry. So? She snapped. What possible response do you want for that sentiment? To hear that it's all okay? I didn't respond. Well, I'm not going to give you that. It isn't okay. I couldn't endure the suspense any longer. Am I fired? I should probably go before Dr. Brutzen's family arrives. I could barely hear my own voice. She peered down at me over her thin spectacles. Most people find comfort in extremes, Dr. Phalus. They want to be seen as good, of course, but the second best option is never partially good, partially bad. Those who are told they're not any good want the comfort of hearing that they were wrong from the start, because that absolves any responsibility of facing our decisions. We seek comfort in impossible corners. She sighed, pursed her lips, then steadied her shaking hand by balling it into a fist. I won't fire you for failing to be perfect, she finally answered. My entire body relaxed the tension that I had been unconsciously holding. I wiped my eye once more. Dr. Brutzen endured severe and immediate trauma. I'm not inclined to think that I could have saved him, even if I'd followed your instructions. Would... would you agree? She leaned forward in her chair. There's a good chance that you're right, and you would get immense comfort if I told you that I agreed. But objective fact exists regardless of my opinion. You will never, ever know for sure. The only way to find relief would have been to follow my instructions from the start. Some things can't be fixed. Remember that last part if you want to endure in the field of medicine. I felt like I'd been hit with a cannonball. Then she got up, walked around the table, and stood over me. I felt like I was two feet tall. Now, Dr. Ophelis, I have to ask you. Have you been struggling with the rules? Shit. Double shit. What was I supposed to say? That I'd been the weak one who never got her own set? That I'd pilfered them from a dead colleague? No, she knew that already. Informing her that I'd lost my stolen copy would certainly be strike three. I really, really didn't need that strike three in that moment. She reached into her pocket and pulled out a piece of paper. It was slightly stained, as though it had been plucked from a pool of blood. You didn't seem to notice that you dropped these while helping me get the dead body into the incinerator. I like that kind of focus. A warmth spread across my chest as she handed the list back to me. Don't fuck up again, Dr. Phalus. The warmth died. Keep a close eye on Rule 7. 
You'll need it soon. I looked down at the rules. God damn it. And for the love of God, memorize these. That is by far the easiest solution. I nodded obediently. These lists have a way of being problematic, she continued. Would you believe that people actually hate reading them? I stared at her in confusion. People hate the list of rules? Dr. Scrit raised her eyebrows. Yes, they say there are too many of them. Never to my face, of course, but always behind my back. What, if they really don't like the list of rules, they can just choose not to read them? She snorted. <laughs> that would make the most sense, but some readers want me to save them from themselves. I shook my head in confusion. I'll never understand that. That's when the door burst open. JD gasped like he'd been running. Dr. Dorian, what the hell are you unable to fix on your own? Dr. Scrit snapped. He was sheet white. It's... it's Dr. Britson. My stomach turned to granite. He's dead, Dr. Scrit replied flatly. Yes, very much so. We discovered that his spinal cord had been severed at the neck, but that hasn't stopped his body from getting out of bed, and he's really, really angry. Everyone has that bitch in their life. That bitch can make you feel so small, she never gives an inch of sympathy or runs out of snarky comments. We despise her with almost all of our souls, save for the tiny part in the corner that secretly hopes for the validation that might come with winning her nod of approval just once. Dr. Vivian Scrit was that bitch. For just a moment after JD burst into the morgue, I thought she would freeze in place, then I was racing to keep up with her, praying that she would have a plan to save our asses. We watched Brutson die! I yelled. What do you mean? His corpse has climbed out of bed? He meant to convey the universally accepted definition of each word as it fits into an English language sentence, Dr. Phelis. Dr. Scrit snapped as we ran after JD. Despite what you learned in kindergarten, there are stupid questions and they're distributed unequally across a population of individuals who remind us that free speech is an unfortunate reality. That bitch. We came to a screeching halt in front of room 330. JD skittered back, eyes wide, afraid to open the door. I don't know what was happening in the room beyond, but it sounded like a subterranean giant had forced a colossal fart through eight feet of mud and smelled twice as bad. Dr. Scrit turned around and stared at the two of us with deadly calm. I don't know if you're prepared for what's on the other side, but the reality is that I don't give a shit, because life doesn't give a shit either. So you're simply going to deal with it. Welcome to the world of medicine. She leaned against the door and opened it wide. Dr. Brutzen had looked bad while he was lying dead, but he was so much worse now. He was standing, facing away from us, swinging angry fists at anyone who approached. I could not see the back of his head, but his neck had twisted to drop his skull into the six o'clock position. Brutzen's body was severely damaged. He swung back and forth, unable to establish stable footing due to his shattered spine. Bony protrusions stuck through his skin, and the destroyed remains of what had once been his vertebrae no longer created a vertical line. Adding to the horror was the clear onset of liver mortis. Most of his arms was the sickly, pale yellow-gray of inedible peaches, but the backs of his thighs were an angry shade of strawberry jam. Tiny lacerations endured in the fall were squeezing concentrated blood through his skin like a jelly donut. Then he turned around. His head was dangling by shredded skin, swinging upside down from what had once been a neck. His jaw flapped aimlessly, revealing a destroyed mouth that had recently vacated its teeth in an unholy enamel spray onto my ankles. Cassie Endelman, another first-year doctor in our class, lay in a corner. Her neck was clearly broken. It looked as though she'd been hurled against a wall at great speed. The analytical part of my brain understood that she had died before she hit the floor. Lydia, the nurse, stood on the other side of the room. She was holding a shaking hand in front of her, slashing a scalpel at Bretson's spinning arms as he approached. Dr. Dorian, on my left! Dr. Scrit yelled over Brutson's growling. We turned around to see an empty space where JD had once stood, the sound of echoing footsteps reverberating down the hallway. 
I see Dr. Dorian wants to learn one of our rules the hard way. She heaved before turning to glare at me sideways. Dr. Ophelis, this has to happen now, so listen very carefully. When life gives you lemons, fuck it. She bent low and lunged at Dr. Brutzen's flailing corpse, slamming him against the wall. Nurse! Grab his arms and pin him down! Ophelis, open the cabinet in the corner! Lydia jumped into action, clasping his wrist and pushing him back. For a moment, Brutzen was still. Then, a guttural roar shook the walls, and his shaking told me that he would soon overpower his two captors. Decompartmentalize. I turned away from them and reached for the cabinet. I had both hands on the handles when I saw it on the door. 1913. It hadn't been there before. No cabinet was numbered. That's not how cabinets work. This number had appeared, suddenly, just for me. And this time, I definitely remembered the rules. I hesitated. Brutzen screamed. Dr. Ophelis, this is not the time for slapdickery! Hurry! Dr. Scrit commanded. I didn't move. When Dr. Scrit spoke again, it was a suddenly softer, yet deathly urgent tone. Only you can see what's in front of you right now, Dr. Ophelis. But there comes a time when you have to make the decision that you'll most be able to live with, and you don't have time to think. I breathed deeply. I can handle this, I told myself as I opened the door. I was wrong. Timothy's body lay crushed on the floor, flattened into a disgustingly small shape for a six-year-old. Yet he was still undoubtedly my little brother, staring up at me in slight judgment and great sadness. The right side of his body had been burned into charcoal, but the left side was perfectly preserved. The worst part, though, was the hazy middle where healthy skin and barbecued flesh united to create a horrified mockery of my brother's face. His right eye socket was empty. His right cheek was gone. The teeth on that side were still present because without any skin to close his face, I could see deep into his tiny head. He licked his lips with a blackened tongue. Why did you leave me, Ellie? I froze. Dr. Phelis, we need you now! You've only come back because you need something from me. Is that right, Ellie? My brother's corpse asked. I sobbed. Lydia screamed, and the sickening sound of breaking bone echoed throughout the room. Why didn't you come in time to save me, Ellie? Why are you here now? I struggled to speak. Then I saw it. A cartoonishly large syringe, clearly made of carbon steel, with a bright yellow H2SO4 printed across it. The needle was hidden, and I knew that it would spring forth once triggered. Timothy was clutching it in his sinewy fingers. I, I need that from you, Timmy, I whispered. He clutched it tighter. But why didn't you need me? Lydia screamed again. Time's almost up, doctor! I'm so, so, so sorry, Timmy. I sobbed. I didn't want to leave you. I know you don't understand, but please, please tell me that you know I love you. The tears rained down uncontrollably. How? He responded sadly. How can I know that you loved me if you left me to die? Dr. Ophelis, decide now! I I'm going to take this, Timmy, but... I love you so, so, so much. I'm your favorite big sister, remember? He stared back with chilling sobriety. If you take this from me now, Ellie, I'll always know that you only came back when you needed to help yourself and that you chose to leave me behind. You'll never see me again. No, I whispered sadly as I plucked the syringe from his grip. Then I turned away from the ghost of my little brother, and I ran to the place where I could make a difference. Lydia lay on the floor with both arms bent at unnatural angles. Brutzen had Dr. Scrit pinned to the ground. His hands were wrapped around Dr. Scrit's wrist, and she was unable to resist as his stronger arms reached out to squeeze her eyeballs. The emotional part of my soul had worn so thin that no veneer was left. Only a time-worn, rocky edge of logic remained as I acted efficiently to complete the task in front of me. I took one, two, three giant steps to build momentum that I transferred into the forceful thrust of my arm. 
I didn't consider how accurate my aim might be because it simply had to reach its target and no second option remained. Brutson's eyeball squished and popped as I slammed the syringe into his face. I felt the reaction as the trigger shot the needle deep into his head, past his eye, and well into his frontal lobe. Then I crashed to the ground. Brutson leaned back and screamed. Dr. Scrit wasted no time in escaping from beneath his grasp, turning to crawl towards me in a furious scramble. I sat, transfixed, as I watched Brutson transform before me. Sulfuric acid affects the skin in much the same way as an open flame does. But I had never seen the effect shooting H2SO4 directly into a cranium. And the show left me transfixed. Brutson grabbed the sides of his head as his face began to melt. He lacked the wherewithal to remove the syringe from his eye, so it dangled in front of him like a bizarre synthetic phallus. Then he coughed, spraying blood across the floor, and leaned forward. His eyeball fell like a dropped marble. It was followed by viscous gray sludge that I presumed to be his quickly dissolving brain. I didn't think I'd be able to pry myself away from the sight in front of me. We need to get Lydia out of here, Dr. Scrit commanded, and suddenly I was able to do the impossible. I held her shoulders as Dr. Scrit pulled Lydia's ankles, and we quickly ran out the door. She slammed it behind her. I fell to my hands and knees in a daze. The next several minutes were blurry. Dr. Scrit did a lot of yelling, and we were suddenly surrounded by people willing to help. I wondered, vaguely, where they had been in those precious seconds when we needed them most. There are certain soul-defining moments, I think, that can only ever be experienced alone. Lydia was put onto a gurney and wheeled away. The same doctor and janitor that I had seen twice before walked quietly into the room, spent a short time inside, then darted quickly out. They each carried a large, wet garbage bag in one hand. Dr. Phelis, you need to come with me. Dr. Scrit's voice was calm and forceful. I, I can't. My brother's in the closet. I mumbled before a wave of emotion silenced me. No. Dr. Aphelis. He isn't. I have to go back, I squeaked. Ellie, she whispered. You can move forward or stay in place, but you can never ever go back. Now, will you follow me? I hesitated. Then I stood, dazedly. I moved until I found myself sitting across her desk for the second time that night. Life always moves slower or faster than we like, but never at the right pace. She explained calmly. Tonight, things have been going faster. She looked down at me over her thin spectacles. I returned only silence. She nodded to herself. We need to do this quickly, and I won't repeat myself, so listen carefully. She cleared her throat. The time has come, Dr. Aphelis, to tell you about rule number seven. She betrayed herself with a glass of water. I sat across from Dr. Vivian's script. Genius doctor and quintessential bitch, unwilling and unable to interrupt the calm that had settled over the room. I was stained with the blood of my deceased colleague, pretty sure that the dead child goop was in my hair, and vaguely aware that I had just gotten a touch of sulfuric acid on my pants. The pause was awkward. She wasn't ready to start her explanation quite yet, so she reached for the glass in front of her. It shook, slightly at first, then badly enough to spill over the edges. She tried to hide it, failed, winced, and finally put the water down. Then she steadied her right wrist with her left hand, pressing it firmly against the desk to keep it from shaking. And, in an instant, the invincible veneer was broken. I saw Dr. Scrit for who she was. A scared, mortal, sad person whose life was closer to the end than it was to the beginning. Sufficiently powerful to control most people, but not strong enough to master herself given how far she strayed from average. She was a bitch of her own volition, both because she was strong and because she was weak. You've had a long night, Dr. Aphelis, she conceded in a measured voice. Against great odds, I was wrong about how long someone like you would last at St. Francis. She sighed. So tell me, why are you here? I wondered briefly if some sort of supernatural paralytic had commandeered my vocal cords before realizing that she simply intimidated the shit out of me. Fast answers are shallow ones, so I'll let you wait for another day to give me your answer. But it had better be good. 
She leaned back in her chair. Now here's the thing. Most people love learning things the hard way because they prefer to see if the rules of physics and common sense have changed to suit their own needs. Idiots are the reason that toasters have warning labels. She stared at me intently. Don't waste my time, doctor. Capiche? I nodded once. Okay then, she breathed. This is the day that I learned about rule number seven. You're giving me a school bus full of dead children on my first day as chief of medicine? I asked a very pale Dr. Matthews. Well, no, most of them are. Well, they're alive for the moment, Dr. Scrip. I closed my eyes and allowed the lightning bolt of pre-migraine to tear through my head unabated, lapping at the frayed gray matter of my skull like a cat teasing every drop of milk from the depths of his bowl with a sandpapery tongue. For three seconds. Then, I breathed out calmly, accepting and embracing the lingering pain as a part of my psyche that would propel me forward. How far out are the first ambulances? Dr. Matthew swallowed. They should be at St. Francis within four minutes. The same flood that washed out the bus has shut down the Interstate 77 bridge over the Elk River, so... Are you telling me that Charleston Area Medical can't take any of the kids? Um, well... That's kind of exactly what I'm saying. My headache enriched. How many surgeries are we going to need to perform? I asked. He winced. We're anticipating twelve. Twelve? That storm is terrible. Why the hell was a school bus out in the... Never mind. Let's get the circus tent pitched. We're very understaffed for this shit and don't have nearly enough pediatric surgeons on a good day. I sighed deeply and ran the numbers in my head. Looks like a couple of interns are about to experience their first solo procedures. Dr. David Yangston had been a standout football player in high school, probably a quarterback, but failed to compete in college because he was still unable to accept the fact that he could improve while still good enough to get away with that as a teenager. Dr. Andrew Braining was never good enough for his parents, so he pursued and achieved academic perfection instead of accepting the immutable fact that they would never be happy because he represented the wrong choices that mom and dad made when they were younger. I knew this about both of them without asking. They wore their stories on their faces, as all people do. And I had, long ago, decided to be literate enough to read every sad tale. We love mystery because it allows for the possibility that some unknown fable has a happy ending we couldn't find. All the while refusing to accept that people stop moving forward when they cease to believe in happy endings. Or even worse, actually find one. You're too young to be leading a solo procedure, but these kids are too young to die. So we're choosing the lesser of two evils. We've got twin children, aged eight, and don't know much about them yet. Dr. Braining, your patient has sustained major abdominal wounds. And Dr. Yangston, yours has potential femoral lacerations. You'll find out more when they arrive. The doors bust open. Game time. A dozen children rolled out of the storm and into St. Francis that day. The incinerator was busy. I prayed to a devil I didn't believe in that my charges would minimize their fuck-ups. Yangston and Braining were the only first-year interns to get solo procedures, so I gave them the simplest cases. Moderate hemorrhaging, potentially from the femoral artery. Let's find out what happened to this kid. Dr. Yangston announced through his surgical mask. We've got signs of internal bleeding. Let's put her under and find out what's wrong. Dr. Braining said quietly as he wiped his sweat from his brow. We're losing a lot of blood, doctor. A nurse warned Yangston as he peered into the boy's split open leg. There's only one person with the title of doctor before his name, and that person needs silence to focus, nurse. I had already confirmed that Yangston had been slapped upside the head far too infrequently as a child, but was not about to reconcile this misfortune while he was wrist deep in a split open child. I looked over at Dr. Braining. The BP is too high, doctor, Nurse Alt explained calmly. Twelve over eight. Everything is fine. Braining responded. I think your BP is too high, doctor, she winked. Relax, you got this. The sweat glistened on his forehead as he nodded. I glanced back around. He's lost nearly a thousand milliliters of blood. Doctor, we need to act now. Nurse, get the hell out of my OR. This is on me, and you're a bigger distraction than you're a help. 
She turned and stalked off immediately, eyeing me angrily as she passed by Dr. Braining's OR. The good news is no major organs or blood vessels are damaged. The bad news is that this piece of metal is lodged deep into her spleen. Braining noted. Remove the mesh. We need to do a splenectomy. And it has to be now. That's when Yangston's patients started coding. What the fuck is wrong with him? Blood loss is too great, doctor. I checked the blood loss. His numbers are fine. Those numbers are fine for an adult. Is this your first time working on a child? We performed the hemogram test and you didn't even check the results. Yangston's face turned bright red against the white surgical mask. You need to get the hell out of my OR, nurse. Your patient's coding. No! My own heart had stopped at this point. I was plunged into complete vertigo when I heard Dr. Braining's patient coding right behind me. What? What happened? You cut his splenic artery, doctor. Alt responded flatly. I'm sorry. My hands are shaking. I'm so sorry. It's okay, doctor, but you need to anastomize the vessel. She responded in a soothing yet firm voice. Okay, okay. I, I, I can't stop shaking. Just give me a second. We don't have a second, doctor. She's losing blood. Alt wiped the sweat from his brow. You can do this. Braining was beginning to hyperventilate. Oh god, I don't want to lose her. Let's make this happen. Across the OR, Yangston was flying. With both of his nurses gone, he was in complete control of the situation. Hands moving everywhere they needed to go with admittedly surgical precision. It's a shame that he was 30 seconds behind schedule. We need a transfusion. He ordered. I turned to look back at Braining. Alt was continually wiping both sweat and tears away from his face, but he was still struggling to see clearly. I could do nothing but stare at the crash card as they both fought to perform the task I had expected of them. I remember the ID number, 8251913, dancing in front of me, because I would see those numbers again. The surgeries had been simple, but something told me one of them would fail. I hated the idea of intuition, but I couldn't shake it. Which did I believe would die, and which would I choose if I had to? Forcing an answer to those questions tells us a hell of a lot about ourselves. At any rate, intuition is bullshit. I curse myself for believing in my emotions instead of simple reality. Mr. and Mrs. Arnaki, I'm Dr. Vivian Scrit. We did everything we could, but your children's injuries were too great to overcome, and we lost them both. I'm so sorry. I'll give you a moment. I got up and left, because there wasn't a damn thing that my comfort could do. I'd had an opportunity to change their world for the better, and I'd fallen short. The time for talking has passed if the moment for action has failed. Besides, I was still on the clock. But I was first in my class at UCLA. Dr. Yangston snapped, seething. People make mistakes all the time. You've been sued for malpractice. And I won those suits, while you've lost your appeal to avoid getting fired. As great as your intelligence is, it still can't fill your inflated head. He ripped off his surgical mask and threw it to the floor. Doesn't matter. He responded, glaring at me with pure hatred. I'm better than this shithole city anyway. I'll find someplace better and be grateful for it. I raised an eyebrow. Dr. Yangston, that procedure was simple. No matter how talented you were in another life, you're just a rookie who wasn't good enough and can't learn from your mistakes. I leaned forward. The world is a better place without you as a doctor. I turned and walked toward the on-call room. Several surgeries were still underway, but I needed to talk with Dr. Braining. I opened the door and found him kneeling by his locker, eyes bulging and face blue. A torn bedsheet reached from his closed locker door to the place where he wrapped it tightly around his neck. I lunged forward in an attempt to loosen the slack, but the second I moved his body, I knew he was dead. After handling enough lifeless corpses, it's usually possible to tell if a body is haunted by the ghost of its sometime occupant, and I knew that Braining was no longer a prisoner of himself. Still, I had to try. It took several seconds of fighting to untie the cord from his neck, and his lifeless body fell instantly to the ground once I was done. His head hit the bench with a sickening crack on the way down, but didn't bleed. I had knelt on the floor to start CPR when I saw the half-empty bottle of Pinto Barbadol by my feet. He had overdosed on enough barbitates to fuck up a bull elephant. 
With every doctor and surgery, I tried by myself to restart his heart. I fought for several minutes in an attempt to find hope in a hopeless case. I failed. Seneca noted that difficulties strengthen the mind as labor does the body, which is why I'm one of the smartest doctors you'll ever meet. Dr. Scrid explained to me as she finished her story. I nodded slowly. Remember what I said about learning things the hard way? I blinked. She sighed. Do you know that people pay more attention to a list of rules when it's harder to access? But I was never given a list. And you earned a lot of gray hairs making sure you learned them anyway. She smirked. What do you say when the person who pisses you off is utterly, totally, and completely right? I was silent. Which brings us back to rule number seven. She continued, folding her hands. Dr. Yangston was the brightest young mind we had recruited in five years, but the gravity of his task could not keep his arrogance in check, so he couldn't live up to the potential that the world demanded of him. She raised a shaking hand to her forehead and massaged her temple. Dr. Braining could not look away from the gravity of the task in front of him, and that killed the arrogant confidence he needed to move on. So... I responded, finally finding my voice. Are you telling me that I'm too arrogant or too meek? She chuckled. <laughs> Both. Then Dr. Scrit dropped her hands to the table, where one trembled just slightly in place. Do you see what this means? She shook her head. Don't answer that. Of course you don't. My face flushed and I remained silent. The reality, Dr. Phalus, is that you need both weaknesses. I need someone in the operating room who knows that someone's world will thrive or collapse based on the smallest gesture, and who understands how terrible a thing any mistake is. Lifetimes change based on how good you are on any given day. When you fail through your own fault, yes, you will fail, and it will ruin someone's life. You need the arrogance to leave it behind you and change the world as though you believe the lie that no ghost haunts your past. That is rule number seven. Can you do two contradicting things at once? Yes, I responded confidently. That's the correct answer. She smiled. And no, you can't. You'll find out the hard way. Now get up, you're needed in surgery. My boss had just told me that I was going to kill someone. The when part of the question was still very much unsettled, but the if component was unable to cast the feeblest shadow of doubt. That's not an easy message to give a doctor. I stood up, reactively, but not out of shock. She had told me that I was needed in surgery, and I was so terrified of Dr. Vivian Scrit that I didn't want to piss her off by obeying too slowly. I, I didn't know there was a surgery scheduled. It, it wasn't... I'm sorry, I don't think it was on my... The funny thing about emergency surgery, Dr. Phalus, is that the procedures are rarely planned. She stared at me over her thin spectacles like I was a small child receiving the third simple explanation to a problem that confused only me. Oh, right. I'm sorry. I turned around, then wheeled immediately back, the blood on my crocs making me slip just a bit. Um, why am I going into emergency surgery? My voice shook like I was doing something wrong. If a patient is counting on me to help them, that would make- That would make you a doctor. She explained with a note of finality. Dr. Dorian is waiting for you in room 825. I breathed deeply. Okay, will we both be observing the procedure? He won't be observing much of anything, Dr. Phalus. She explained condescendingly. Patients under general anesthesia rarely know what's going on. That's kind of the point. I felt my jaw drop. I, I didn't know if I looked stupider when I reacted with shock or if I appeared unaffected. So I tried to stand in the middle ground of ambiguous social feedback that had defined my awkward period between birth and death. She wrinkled her brow at me. I can tell by your reaction that you're focused on satisfying my expectations, but eventual failure is easier to accept if you concern yourself with the objective result at the expense of fleeting social expectations. Run. I made it to room 825 in under two minutes. J.D. was lying unconscious on an operating table. I had just seen him a few minutes earlier when he ran out of an OR that held a very angry corpse of Dr. Brutson. 
and here he lay, unconscious and ashen-faced, looking for all the world like a deflated balloon. A young nurse was the only other person in the room. What happened? I asked. Don't know. The patient is monitorized, and we're waiting for an ECG readout. BP is 10 over 6 and dropping. No external lacerations. No signs of internal bleeding or trauma. I grabbed my hair and pulled tightly. JD wasn't a patient, and this suffering made no sense. Just like Brutson's agony and death, or Myron's inexplicable autocannibalism. I wanted to scream and punch the wall, then curl up in the janitor's closet. So I closed my eyes, breathed in, and counted to three. Compartmentalize. I opened my eyes and understood that a puzzle lay before me. What state was he found in? A janitor came across him lying unconscious on the ground just outside the front door. Have his vitals changed? Not in the past three minutes. Grab a ventilator filter and prepare for possible intubation. Yes, doctor. I need to see if I can find... What's wrong? Patients experiencing ventricular fibrillation. Let's move! Defibrillator's ready, doctor. The first surge of electricity lifted his chest several inches from the table. I watched in horror as his mouth opened and his tongue flopped out onto his cheek. That wasn't normal. The second jolt brought him nearly a foot into the air. His fingers danced and jittered before slowly coming to rest by his side, unnaturally straight. My blood chilled as his gray fingers periodically twitched as though seeking an invisible trigger. The nurse blanched. Patients, not showing any cardiological signs he's been shocked, doctor. I prepped the defibrillator once more, wondering what could happen with the third round. I was ready for anything. I was surprised. I sent a thousand volts of electricity into JD's heart and nothing happened. He didn't move, he didn't twitch. Surely, none of his vitals showed any signs of life at all. I called time of death on a colleague for the second time that night. Nineteen minutes after racing out of Dr. Scritt's office, and thirteen minutes after beginning a fruitless attempt at CPR. I dismissed the nurse halfway through so that she might save some patient with a reasonable chance to postpone the inevitable. Once I had accepted defeat, I wiped away tears and snot as I stared down at JD's dead body. That's when he opened his eyes. He had no pupils or irises, only a sea of sad whiteness spread between his lids, vacant and sad and soul-crushingly empty. His lifeless arm grabbed my wrist hard enough to send lightning bolts of pain through my shoulder. Slowly, his corpse sat up. Ellie, he whispered. His voice sounded weak and far away, like an echo coming up through a narrow cave. I tried to pull away, but he was just too strong. Your brother, Timmy, is here in hell with me. I sobbed. He wants you to know something. He continued in an unholy reverberation, staring through me with no eyes to focus. He says that it's your fault he's here, and that if you ever loved him, you'll come down to burn with the rest of us. Every second hurts so much that he wishes he'd never been born. He hissed at me. Then he fell to the table, once again, quite dead. I pulled my arm from his cooling fingers and stumbled into the hallway. Tears were brewing like storm clouds, slow, but thick and angry. I could sense the heavy, dewy heat and charged tension behind my eyes, and I could feel my breaking point drawing closer, inevitable and inorexable. I looked up and saw her across from me in the hallway. No one else was present. Dr. Scritt was staring me down like a rival at the OK Corral. I knew that this moment needed to break something wide open so that this terrible seed could spread its unholy tendrils across the blurred lines that divided this hospital from my own thoughts. Tears and words poured involuntarily from my face. Sam Brutson, Myron Caldwell, Jim Dorian, and Cassie Endelman all died tonight, Dr. Scritt. What is going on at St. Francis? She drew her lips into a thin white line. To be honest, I expected you to be first, Ellie Aphelis. She folded her arms. I folded mine. Rule nine, verbatim, now. The morgue must house at least 13 cadavers at all times. I responded without thinking. The ghost of a smirk brushed past her lips, which she quickly hid. 
Dr. Dorian did not respect his obligation when I needed him to rise to the occasion during Dr. Brutson's unwellness. This hospital can give life, Dr. Phalus, and it can take away, but never without meaning. Dr. Scritt took a deep breath. Unfortunately for Dr. Dorian, he chose to violate the rules when the morgue had only 12 residents. The crooked scales have a way of balancing themselves, and we never have the final judgment. I wanted to fire back, to tell her that she was incorrect, to explain all the things she had overlooked because the world had jaded her inaccurate and unfair judgment. It felt very clear that she was maliciously wrong, but when I opened my mouth to speak, not a single word found its way out. Dr. Scritt nodded slowly. There are some things we shouldn't see, but have to face. Are you ready? Yes, I snapped. No, child, you're not. All of the dead people you named were smarter and better educated than you. Given the consequences that they've all suffered, do you realize what's at stake? Unable to find my voice, I nodded. She rolled her eyes. Human reproduction is driven mostly by stupidity, and the only reason we've made it this far is because our idiotic desire to kill ourselves is slightly outpaced by our idiotic need to engineer unplanned pregnancies. She rubbed her temple. Now, if you're going to have an emotional breakdown, please make it happen now. It's kinder to send you out the door with broken dreams weighing down an inadequate mind than with the room temperature body weighing down an overused gurney. I had no idea what to say, so I stayed in place. She shook her head. Brighter minds than yours have failed at half of what you want to accomplish. Why are you still here, Dr. Phalus? I brushed away a tear. Maybe you feel it's unfair that the past has changed you, so you want to change the past? My breath hitched. Every doctor wants to be a vanguard between life and death, but we know that the latter wins eventually. Why are you here? I shook my head. I can't change the past, I whispered. All I have are myself and the present. One of us is going to control the other. I wiped my nose, wiped my eyes, and wished I had done things in the opposite order. She turned crisply around and walked away. I followed without instruction. We stopped in an ordinary part of an ordinary hallway that I had passed dozens of times before. The funny thing, though, is that nothing is ordinary. I stood flabbergasted as I stared at a door that had not existed before that moment. Dr. Scritt would not look at the edifice. She instead stood next to it, staring at me in harsh judgment. It's too late to ask if you understand what I'm about to tell you, so I'll say my part and then leave you with your choices. No ordinary person can be a doctor, and no ordinary doctor can survive at St. Francis. The wisest choice would be to walk away right now and pursue a long life of predictability and oblivious joy, only to return decades later with the false hope that death is an option. I've done everything in my power to warn you about moving forward from this point, because you won't like what you see at the end of the path." She narrowed her eyes at me. If you choose not to give up, that's on you. Then she turned and walked briskly away from me. I tried, and failed, to steady my shaking breath. I knew that I would go through the door in the same way I knew I would get out of bed every morning. There was only one way forward. Slowly, I looked up at the door that had not been real outside this point in time. Etched in its ancient wood was a number. 1913. I had memorized the rules at this point, but it no longer mattered. Barely containing my nausea, I reached out a feeble hand and turned the knob. It opened easily, almost lovingly. I swallowed and nodded. The faint smell of smoke invaded my nostrils as I stepped forward. I told myself I could handle whatever was in there. I was wrong. I changed my mind about opening the door as soon as I touched it, and tried to go back right as the latch clicked shut. It wouldn't reopen, of course, but I still wasted my time trying. I shut my eyes to hold in the tears and keep out the burn. St. Francis was an impossible place, and many of the things I'd seen this night defied everything I had believed about reality but what I felt on the other side of this door stretched my mind like bubblegum. 
I imagined a fat, drooling man chewing on my brain with a fierce, angry gnashing that squished the gray matter carelessly between the clean, white teeth. This couldn't be. The cicadas proved me wrong. They sang a ceaseless, screeching hymn that pressed against my senses with aggression only matched by the weighty humidity of a hot Missouri summer. I knew that once I opened my eyes, I would see the blood-red cardinal flowers dancing lazily in the midday sun, showing no concern for the blood-red fire voraciously consuming my childhood home. I opened my eyes at the screen. There was no doubt of its origin. I knew that a 12-year-old Elia Phalus was about to run out of the roasting structure, her shirt burning hot enough to consume her dermis and leave a very ugly, very permanent mark on her tiny body. I instantly realized that she couldn't see me. Her terrified eyes pleaded for help but found no one. She was a smart girl, so she knew to hit the ground and roll furiously until her burning shirt had been extinguished. She would be unable to peel it off, however as the smoldering polyester slowly ate its way onto grafted skin. Removing the garment was not her concern, though. She leapt to her feet and wheeled around to stare at the burning edifice, too terrified to re-enter, too mortified to walk away. Timmy! She screamed. I'm sorry I told you to fuck off! You have to get out of your room! Timmy! The burning house belched a fresh tongue of flame, and she stepped back. The scream came from upstairs. I know you can hear me! You have to get out of the house! Now! Ellie? His voice was meek, but it oozed more terror than should have been possible. I don't know how to get out! You have to help me! The young girl froze. Please come help me, Ellie! I'm sorry I stole your computer! I'm sorry! Please get me out of here! It's getting really hot, and I think the fire's coming into my bedroom soon! She sobbed, but said nothing. Then she closed her eyes and charged into the house. One foot had crossed the threshold before she turned and jumped back out, holding her arms over her face. You have to get yourself out, Timmy! I can't go in there! She screamed to the second story window. Yes, you can, Ellie! Please! My door is on fire! No one else is home! You have to come get me! She began weeping openly now, deep guttural sobs racked her frail body as she took several steps away from the house. Timmy, you have to jump. I'm so sorry, but I can't help you. It's not that far to the ground. I can't jump. I, I can't. Ellie, there's fire inside my room. No. She doubled over, then stepped back farther. Please jump. You can go back in the door, Ellie. Go around to my other side. My bed is on fire. It's too hot. Her jaw quivered. I, I can't go back in the door, Timothy. She responded in a much lower voice. Yes, you can. I'm too scared. She trailed off. I'm burning it. It hurts. She crumpled to the ground and buried her face in her hands. Young Ellie stayed like that for a long time but Timothy said nothing more. The north wing of the house collapsed just as firefighters arrived. The first engine was understaffed. No matter how many times they yelled at her, no one could spare a moment to physically pull the distraught girl away. So she watched as they subdued and contained the fire. My, my brother's in the house, she whispered. They were professional firefighters, but not therapists and they dove in to rescue him without a second thought for their own safety or her need for comfort. She grabbed the last one before he ran away from her. Over there, she instructed in a barely audible voice as she pointed to the wreckage of the North Wing. He responded without acknowledging her, racing to pull apart the smoking rubble of the boards and glass that she had once called home. Johnny, Roy, call a fucking ambulance now! He threw aside the blackened wood of my broken house and stopped cold. Then he bent over and threw up. I wanted to tell the young girl to stop walking, to turn away and spend a life wondering how terrible death could be instead of confirming that the worst of our assumptions is true. But I knew that she would not have listened to me even if I had been able to influence this world. So she drifted onward, pushed less by curiosity than by the dreamlike state of obligation that drives the vast majority of every action we will ever take. I knew the sensations would hit her in stages. 
that's what roasting human meat smells like. Followed by, I can hear him moaning, he's still alive. And right on its heels, I've never heard a person dying, but I'm certain that's what's unfolding before me. Then, all at once, came the visual. I found that I had been unconsciously following in her footsteps. As unable to turn away, as it was impossible to affect the ghost who didn't see me, she and I arrived at the firefighter simultaneously, both looking into the ruins of our life at the exact same destructive moment. Nothing was left of Timmy's skin. Even after my years in medicine, I still would not have realized that the pile of human meat below me was a six-year-old human without prior knowledge of that fact. His lips had been burned away, so every tooth was exposed to the outside world. The char that covered most of his body looked like a combination of rare steak and pop sits, but it was his eyes that drew me in the most. Without lids, they stared fixedly into the sky as though brazenly expecting a god to care and staring in horrified shock at what he saw looking back. Then he opened his mouth and screamed. It was much quieter than the memory implanted on my 12-year-old mind. Looking back, I had always believed that it was a gale-strength holler, one that announced to anyone who doubted that I was thoroughly guilty. Watching it for the second time, however, proved it to be a meek, gurgling, sad cry that could only have been emitted by a creature far too frail to understand the concept of death. The sobbing clashed with my memory. I had pictured myself collapsing into a heap and moaning softly, utterly too broken to weep. It took several seconds to realize that I was crying, there in the past present, surrounded by people, but totally alone. I stumbled forward, clambering over the broken wood in an effort to get closer to what remained of my brother. I don't know what drove my actions, but none of us know what steers our purest motives. My foot caught on a stray board, and I landed face to face with his corpse. I heaved, but I had to speak. I'm sorry, I whispered to the memory. Every day since this one has been spent regretting what I failed to do. It's why I'm a doctor, but the past doesn't go away. I drew in a shuddering breath. Please just tell me you loved me, even as you hated me. I knew that he was dead, but did not understand the rules of the world beyond 1913. So I hoped. That hope was fulfilled when my brother rotated his head. For the first time, another person acknowledged my presence here. Go through the door, Ellie. I gasped and blinked. <gasps> when I opened my eyes again, he was staring upward once more, very clearly dead. Had I imagined his instructions? Hell, was I imagining everything? I turned to look back at the shattered little girl. She was curled into a ball, eyes wide open and mouth gasping like a fish, needing with all of her being to be held and loved by absolutely anyone and finding nothing. I knew that the mental trauma was burning its way into her neurons, just like the melting shirt was dissolving the mid-layer of her skin, breaking it down cell by cell with each tick of the second hand, leaving indelible scars that would forever seek healing that no doctor could ever provide. I left her there. I stood, swaying, unsure of where to go, but somehow certain that the path would find a way to present itself to me. I stumbled my way out of the burning rubble. I moved from the heat into the light, and I stood in the front yard that I had not seen in fourteen years. I'd always been happy there, which is why I never went back. The door in the middle of the yard was new. It stood impossibly in the middle of the lawn, coming from nowhere and leading nowhere. I was quite certain that I was the only one who could see it because it was meant just for me. I stumbled, I walked, and then I moved confidently toward the knob, grasping it, accepting that I was broken, but not completely so. I nodded to myself. Then I turned the handle, opened it wide, and stepped forward. I was met by the smell of smoke. The whine of cicadas hit me next, followed by the thudding of the door as it closed behind me. I shut my eyes tight as the blood-red fire voraciously consuming my childhood home glowed through my lids, unwilling to accept my next step in the path that only pretended to care about my opinion. I opened my eyes at the screen. 
I watched again, helplessly, as the 12-year-old version of myself endured the type of pain that adults fool themselves into thinking they can deny their children. I watched my little brother burn. I saw more of his body this time. The initial shock gave way to an unrelentingly critical doctor's eye. His charred vertebrae and demolished spinal cords spilled disgustingly onto the ground like discarded butcher's offal. I realized vaguely that Timmy must have landed on his neck, bursting his destroyed innards and his barbecued skin shredded from the impact of the collapsing house. It broke more of me than I had thought possible. Deep fissures cleaved my mind in ways that I once would have believed impossible to endure, but I left the broken pieces of me on the road and found that I could travel lighter once there was less of me to carry. It was, to be honest, brutally efficient. In that moment, I understood how the world could change a person into a quintessential shit bitch, and in becoming stronger, I was able to make it through the journey yet again, this time confidently grasping the door on the other side, now more whole because there was less of my spirit. Smoke hit me first, followed by the warm humidity of an old Missouri summer, and of course, there was the scream. I collapsed on the ground, unable to move any farther. I got up, of course, because what else was there to do? I had to choose between moving on and spending the rest of my life completely immobile. I was not going to allow the location of fate's arbitrary decision to determine the rest of my years. So I stood and I moved. I endured everything again, and I discovered just how much of myself could be broken while still moving forward. I arrived at the end, I opened the door, and I walked into the screen. I once heard that the trees in West Texas are shaped by winds that rip across the open plains. The constant pressure warps them in time, no matter how great the tree. It is permanently marred by a world that would never relent. The original design of the plant becomes unsalvageable, and the brokenness evolves into an inedible part of the tree's character. It can never hope to become what it had once intended. But still, the tree grows. It was easier to travel without the burden of hope, so I discarded the last vestiges upon the second opening, and casually found my way into Dr. Scritt's office. Close the door behind you, she ordered. I obeyed out of practicality and stood before her. Well, she regarded me over her thin spectacles. Are you going to have a long cry about it and then talk about what happened? Or will you be skipping the part that has no practical value so we don't waste any more of my time? I sat in the chair across from her. I've exhausted every tear. I responded simply. Good, she shot back. I hope that fact lightened your burden. I almost asked her why she was so mean, but silenced myself. People only change if they want to change. I had no desire to quarrel with facts that didn't care if I believed in them. She eyed me carefully. You never told all of the story because you were afraid of what people would say. I nodded. My mind was so completely stretched, shocked, used, that I had nothing left to offer but stark practicality. How did you know? She looked sad. Because, Dr. Phalus, that's everyone's story. I stared at her blankly. She sighed. Each one of us is ashamed about some part of our past. We believe that keeping it a secret allows us to control the thing that is beyond our grasp. This stems from the fact that people are idiots. I had no response. Letting go of the false belief means controlling the past, Ellie. At least to some small extent, that we still can. You're not losing by dropping the illusion. I took a deep breath. I feel like admitting it makes you a shitty person. Yes, I know. She responded with a roll of her eyes. But admitting the truth does not make you a shitty person. It's what you did that makes you shitty. She flared her nostrils and was silent. Without neither preamble nor permission, I began my explanation. Timmy and I have been fighting. I heaved. I just received a new laptop since I was 12 and he was 6. I got many of the things that Timmy wanted but couldn't have. I gloated when he cried because it made me feel like I had more. My dad was a janitor and we couldn't afford most of what I thought I needed 
So when I finally got the laptop I knew I deserved, I taunted my brother worse than I had ever before. I drew a deep, shuddering breath. So he stole it when I wasn't looking and locked himself into my bedroom. I'd never, ever been so angry. I actually told him to fuck off, which was the first time I'd ever said those words. His favorite stuffed animal, this ridiculous oversized bear, was left unguarded in his bed, so I stole it, yelled across the house that I was going to destroy it, and ran downstairs. I buried my face in my hands. I threw it on the stove and turned on the pilot light, and I was so happy when it finally caught fire. Timmy ran into the kitchen just as the flames engulfed his bear. I saw just how deeply I'd hurt him, deeper than he'd ever felt, and I was overjoyed. The pain I'd caused my brother seemed so good in that moment, and I don't know why, but I was sure he deserved it. I paused. Then I continued, because there was nothing else to do. He... he told me he was going to throw my laptop out the window, that he would lock himself in my room and smash it to pieces on the ground. Then he turned and ran. I cleared my throat. So I grabbed the stuffed bear's leg, which was dangling off the edge of the stove and not yet burning, and hurled it at him. I pursed my lips and nodded solemnly to myself. Why does any twelve-year-old make a decision other than because it seemed like a good idea at the time? I didn't plan on having the bear hit the wall and land in the trash can, and I had no idea how quickly a garbage fire could spread through the kitchen. I bit my lip until I tasted blood, but I was old enough to weigh my options. I knew that I had enough time to get up the stairs, but probably not back down again, because the fire had consumed half the kitchen in under 20 seconds. I drew several shallow breaths. I also knew that I could exit through the kitchen's back door to immediate safety. More shallow breaths. I had to make a practical decision in a split second, and I was still angry in that split second. Angry at my brother, but also at myself, though I was too young to understand it at the time. I swallowed. It would be so much easier to say that it was either all cold practicality or else all hot vengeance. I reasoned like a child, but was mature enough to understand what my decision meant. The reality is that both concepts pulled my mind across a twisted landscape of opposing ideas, ensuring the decency of being all one thing or all of another. I dropped my hands to my side and stared unwaveringly at Dr. Scrit. I decided to turn my back and run outside. I remember every part of that choice. It shattered my heart and my mind badly enough that I know I'll never be whole again. I took one more long breath. But each day I hurt a little more because I can't stop thinking of what I would do if I could go back, and I know that I would probably still make the same choice. For the first time that I could remember, she broke eye contact first. Ellie, she sighed. Why do you think that St. Francis Hospital would have such an arbitrary set of rules for its interns? I responded without emotion. The rules come from somewhere beyond us. I understand that now. We're just here to follow them. She looked sad. Then slowly, Dr. Scrit shook her head. No, Dr. Phelis. That isn't true. She rubbed her eyes. What was the first rule? Never, under any circumstances, share your copy of the rules with anyone else, I replied robotically. She raised an eyebrow. And how does that make any sense? I stumbled as I tried to remember the words. Y you, it was important to see not all of us were going to make it. That much is true, she responded dismissively. We've seen more than enough evidence of that tonight. But you're wrong about the rule coming from somewhere else. She stared pointedly across her desk at me. I stared back. I don't understand. Then you're starting to get it, she shot back. You weren't top of your class, Dr. Ophelis, not even close, but you're at least smart enough to be a doctor. Can you attempt to figure this out? I quickly calculated the odds of making an ass of myself in ratio to the probability of answering correctly, and remained silent. She shook her head in disappointment. Did you really never make the connections, Dr. Phelis? The trial of jumping off a roof, judgment from an authoritative janitor, multiple different rules about burning children? My jaw fell. 
The first rule prohibits the sharing of roles because no one has the same set. Each doctor is faced with his or her own list of restrictions and most aren't up to the challenge. I struggle to find the words. Every, every rule is just for me? Dr. Scrit removed her glasses. People think that this hospital wants to destroy them, when in reality, each person is given every toll needed for survival. She snorted. It's impossible to stop most individuals' desire to kill themselves. I stared at her desk in shock. But, rule four, why did it tell me not to touch your Reese's peanut butter cups? She stared at me like I'd been caught masturbating in a fish tank. Because it's my favorite candy. I nodded slowly. Mine, too. Dr. Scrit placed the glasses back on her head. You're going to ask what this place is. She continued slowly. I've survived St. Francis far longer than most. That's why people expect me to tell them. She paused, choosing each of her words very carefully. So before you say that you want me to tell you the truth, you should understand this fact. Here, she bored her eyes into mine. And this time, it was me who turned away early. There are things that I can't know and things that I don't know. Embracing these ideas as a strength instead of a weakness is the reason I've endured where others have not. We were quiet for some time. Can... can you see the individual rules on each doctor's paper? I asked suddenly. She smirked. No, but I can see what's written on their faces, which is the same thing. I don't get it. I responded honestly. She sighed in disappointment. Do you remember when I reminded you of Rule 9? I thought back to our conversation just after Dr. Dorian had died. You told me the morgue needed 13 cadavers at all times, I replied confidently. No, she shot back. You told me that. I acted like I had known the entire time, and you responded to my confidence. Each person's list of rules is their own battle to fight. To be blunt, I'd rather see the doctors fail themselves through inadequacy than see the patient suffer because someone was unable to live up to their own unearned arrogance. I blinked. I'd like to earn my arrogance, I said. Dr. Scrit smiled. The good news is that I think you might have endurance to survive the unusually lengthy journey it would take for you to achieve earned arrogance. The door burst open before I could say anything more. I said nothing as a familiar janitor walked confidently to Dr. Scrit's office. For the first time, I heard him speak. Three children have been dead for 119 minutes. Thirteen people are not in the morgue, and Dr. Falhar ignored me when I tried to stop him from stealing Dr. Grault's list. Dr. Scrit stood, and I followed suit. Wait, Dr. Scrit, please. I looked at her in desperation. She gave me a look that told me I had one quarter of a second to speak. Is this real? She looked away and walked around her desk. Death is real. Nothing else is guaranteed. Doctors are tasked with delaying the inevitable and embracing the fact that 100% of our efforts will eventually fail. I walked briskly after her as she followed the janitor out of her office. If death is the only real thing, then this life is a place where impossible things can happen. Stop doubting that fact. Now, grab the sulfuric acid. We're going to attempt to prevent your fellow interns from killing each other or any of the patients. It seemed obvious that someone was going to die. I ran down the hallway with Dr. Scrit and the janitor. I ran until my lungs told me to stop, and then I kept going. At some point, the janitor wasn't with us anymore, or perhaps he was, but not physically. At any rate, only Dr. Scrit and I arrived at the room where Gralt and Falhar were fighting. The latter had pinned the former to the ground. I recognized a familiar list clutched in Dr. Gralt's hand. They each outweighed me by an easy hundred pounds. I stared at them and froze, realizing that I was powerless to stop them. Dr. Scrit, whose frame was essentially identical to mine, pushed past me. Hey! She screamed. Cut that shit out! But he took my... Now! Then, Dr. Scrit turned around and walked out the door. The two doctors did not react at first. Then, Falhar slowly stood and backed away from Gralt, who was shakily getting to his feet. 
I lifted my jaw back into place, then turned to leave. I still know what you did, came the whisper from behind me. I wheeled back around. Dr. Gralt was staring incredulously at Dr. Falhar. You're completely insane. You know that, right? Falhar lunged, and the next several seconds blurred confusingly around me. Slowly, I realized that I had jumped between them to hold Dr. Falhar back. He was crying. I didn't kill him five years ago, and I've been regretting it every day since. His face turned ashen as he struggled to find his next words. I turned to see Dr. Gralt pressed against the wall, terrified. He was pudgy enough as it was, and all I could imagine was a scared-looking Pillsbury doughboy with a trembling, scrubs-covered gut. I rolled my eyes and faced Dr. Falhar. Did you break a rule? His eyes brimmed with tears. I understood that he was breaking, and it irritated the fuck out of me. I'd use shorter sentences, but my initial query only had five words, and English syntax prohibits me from dumbing it down any farther. It came from my mouth as though someone else were speaking. I thought of the space between the doors and wondered just how much of myself had been burned away. I looked in room 825. I saw something from the past that triggered the ammonia smell that tells me your scrubs are going out with the trash. I snapped. Listen. I continued in a more soothing voice. Why don't you head back to the break room and drink a nice warm cup of get the fuck over yourself? Then come back when you're ready to undertake the monumental task of executing your employment obligations without committing homicide. He stared at me like I'm an idiot. Because if I can get over myself, anyone can. The words spilled like water flushing down a drain, leaving me empty but clean. I turned to see Dr. Skrit's reflection in a glass cabinet. She was smiling. Six of us endured the first year. Falhar was among them. Gralt was not. People, doctors, and ghosts came and went. Most carried a faulty sense of permanence about their own presence, shocked when the next turn of life's wheel replaced their carefully constructed niche with someone equally dispensable. I endured. There wasn't a specific moment when I realized I wanted to be the chief of medicine, nor even one where I realized I wanted it. The drive built slowly within me, and I was halfway down the road before I realized where I was going. Years passed. St. Francis Hospital did not cease to become strange, but I made a conscious decision to stop trying to understand it. I gradually became to appreciate just how odd human beings are. Accepting the quirks of the hospital was much easier in that context. I still cremated children immediately after offering efficient condolences to their parents. I never went onto the roof, and I quietly ignored room 1913 whenever it mysteriously appeared. I was sitting across from Dr. Skrit when she opened a thank you note from a patient that she diagnosed and eventually saved. Despite being several hundred words long, she tossed it in the trash after a two-second glance. Do you know that Vivian means life? I asked. She snorted. I am what I do. People hate that reality, which is the only reason they assign names in the first place. The next big change was coming soon. It infused my thoughts like damp air whispering of a coming storm. I thought I was ready for it, which proved that some lessons are never learned. I had been walking through the same hallway that drew me in years earlier. On that day, only a familiar janitor haunted its walls. I'd seen him periodically throughout the years, rarely talking and never aging. This time, however, he looked right at me and spoke. It's time to make a choice, Ellie. He explained softly. My blood froze. He turned aside and looked toward a space in the wall that had only occasionally held a physical door. It stood there now, slightly ajar. The numbers were etched deeply into the wood, warped and worn like they had been there for years. Why does it say 3191? I asked. He smiled sadly. It's your opportunity to go backwards. I swallowed. I'd gotten used to tricking myself into confidence by imitating others, but felt weak in this moment. Where does it lead? I asked shakily. Rural Missouri. He continued in a paternal voice. Far from any town, about 30 minutes away from Driskin. He raised his eyebrows. But that's not the real question now, is it? I closed my eyes. When does it lead? 
He waited until I looked at him once again before he continued. August 25th, 2005. I wiped away a tear. Can it go any earlier? No. He responded quickly. I'd have very little time to prepare. The world turns on what people do with very little. I dried my face, but was quickly losing control of myself. Okay, I responded, voice shaking. I need to go back. I took a deep breath. I can be ready in a few days. Where will I find the door? The janitor stood very still. Right here. Right now. My stomach dropped. No, 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 no. I I'm not ready right this second. I need to prepare if my life is going to change. The tears and snot were flowing unabated, and I was losing the will to stop them. He folded his hands quietly. If you don't go now, the door disappears. You'll never see it again. I fell to my knees. What choice did I have? Okay, I whispered. Okay, I'll go now. I looked up. When I come back, will the world be different? He was silent for a beat. Then... You can only go back the hard way, Ellie. My stomach plummeted. That was 26 years ago! I, I can't lose that much of my life! He sighed. Yes, you can. People lose that much every day. I sobbed once. Well... I don't understand. Is my body going to reverse in age, or will I just look like this and die 26 years earlier? You don't get any extra time, Ellie. He continued with a patient voice. Any year that you live twice takes away from what would have been. I barely suppressed the urge to vomit. But, I gasped, but will it be like the last time I went back? Or will I be able to change things now? He smiled more joyfully this time but still tinged with a sadness that I suspected was a permanent condition of his existence. The past will be yours to change as you decide. The world will be different as a result of your choices. Adrenaline shot through me. Ellie. He continued. You always knew that last part was true, right? The floodgates opened, and I ugly cried. I pitched forward, pressing my hands against the floor. I need time to process this. You don't have time, and you don't need it. Right now, you have to step through that door or walk away forever. He reached out, grabbed the knob, and began to pull it shut. We like to pretend that grave decisions take time, because it allows us to believe that deep thought changes our basis instincts. But we are our truest selves in short moments of high consequence. So I leapt to my feet. I squeezed through the door just as he closed it behind me one last time. They say a new door opens every time a different one closes, but that's a bunch of horse shit. For people too afraid to admit that the past is gone. The door closed behind me with a dead sound. I was in a hallway at St. Francis Hospital. I turned around to see the door to the same janitor's closet where I'd first read a list of rules all those years ago. Cautiously, I opened it and peeked inside. The noxious smell of ammonia greeted me as I reached for the bare bulb and pulled the chain. Sallow light illuminated a neglected storage space and nothing more. You won't get into Narnia again by that route. A voice shot from behind me. I wheeled around to find the familiar janitor standing patiently next to me with his hands in his pockets. I'd gotten very good at reading faces over the years, of dealing with dying and otherwise incompetent people but I could not for the life of me gauge what was happening behind his eyes. He was the same age that he had always been, so there was no way to tell what year was happening around me. Then I heard a buzz from a Nokia push-button cell phone on a nearby counter. I looked up at the boxy television hanging from the ceiling. It featured a grainy presentation of American Idol with Simon Cowell, who was apparently still alive. I reached for my pocket to grab my iPhone 1X only to remember that I'd left it in a different coat. My head spun. They're waiting for you. The janitor responded simply, his hand outstretched. Dazedly, I took three steps in the direction he'd indicated. Then I turned back, and he was gone. So I put one foot in front of the other, determined to keep moving until I figured out where the hell I was supposed to go. You're early. A voice called out. There's an auspicious beginning. I scanned the hall until I realized that I was approaching Dr. Scritt's office. The voice was coming from inside. 
I went through the door. The room was decorated hideously, and I suddenly felt a wave of appreciation for the style that Dr. Scrit would eventually bring. The storm raging outside nicely complemented the mood evoked by the taupe and gray curtains. A short, balding man waddled over to me, hand outstretched. His clothing style echoed the can't-groom-myself motif that his general appearance exuded, and I hoped for his sake that he compensated in intellect what he lacked in physical appeal. Jerry Ringwater, CFO, pleased to meet you. The higher-ups have been foretelling your arrival for a while now. He grasped my hand with a small, clammy palm and shook vigorously. Between you and me? He muttered in a lower voice. I think it's about damn time St. Francis had a woman chief of medicine. He winked. I looked up to see half a dozen hospital administrators. Their number included John Stevens, looking years younger and much healthier than when I'd last seen him in a casket. At this point in the timeline, he hadn't quite yet inherited Mr. Ringwater's job. I clenched my sphincter to avoid painting the floor with shock. By the way, Jerry continued, raising his voice for the group of people behind him. The higher-ups explained that you've just legally changed your name. I have to apologize, but they did not inform us of your new moniker. What should we call you, Doctor? I looked up at the glass cabinet behind the desk, and my reflection looked blurrily back. I needed glasses. Thin spectacles, to be precise. In another 14 years, I'd be her spitting image. Oh, shit. Fuck my life, I whispered. P pardon me? Jerry responded, flabbergasted. I turned sharply on him and narrowed my eyes. I said, Vivian Scrit. My name means life. He paled slightly and swallowed. Of course, Dr. Scrit. My apologies. He took two small steps back from me. Would you like to meet Dr. Matthews, our chief of surgery? My mind was slowly wrapping itself around the new reality that was impossible yet omnipresent. Not one hidden wisp of the real world remained. I felt vertigo as I understood just how frail the gossamer strands of our existence truly are, and wondered whether dying is another way of admitting that we were never real. A sudden shock of urgency rocked through my aching head, and I had to reclench my sphincter. Date! I yelled, grabbing Jerry's flabby biceps hard enough to make him wince. What's the date today? He stared at my hand, slack-jawed, and was unable to answer before John Stevens interrupted us. Ah, Dr. Scrit, meet our chief of surgery, Dr. Ma I need you to come with me right now. Shot a tall man in scrubs as he was rushing towards us. Panic carved into his eyeballs. Are you officially the chief of medicine? I was about to look around the group for confirmation, but an invisible force turned my head away from them and made me step confidently forward. Jerry spoke up from behind me. She's... Already on the clock, as are the rest of you. Thank you for showing yourselves out, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Dr. Matthews, I'm Dr. Vivian Scrit. Let's walk and talk. He had the essence of a man who eschewed dealing in bullshit. I like this fact, but it increased my growing sense of panic given how nervous he was. Doctor, I've never seen anything like it. Nineteen minutes ago, the school bus rolled down an embankment. At least thirteen deaths have been confirmed. The storm has shut down half the roads in Charleston. At least six of my surgeons are unable to find a way to get to the hospital. This was it. I suppose I also ought to speak the part. You're giving me a school bus full of dead children on my first day as chief of medicine? I asked a very pale Dr. Matthews. Well, no, most of them are. Well, they're alive for the moment, Dr. Scrit. I closed my eyes and allowed the lightning bolt of pre-migraine to tear through my head unabated, lapping at the frayed gray matter of my skull like a cat teasing every drop of milk from the depths of his bowl with a sandpapery tongue. For three seconds. Then I breathed out calmly, accepting and embracing the lingering pain as a part of my psyche that would propel me forward. How far out are the first ambulances? Dr. Matthew swallowed. They should be at St. Francis within four minutes. The same flood that washed out the bus has shut down the Interstate 77 bridge over the Elk River, so... Are you telling me that Charleston Area Medical can't take any of the kids? Um, well, that's kind of exactly what I'm saying. My headache enriched. How many surgeries are we going to need to perform? 
I asked. He winced. We're anticipating 12. 12? That storm is terrible. Why the hell was a school bus out in the... Never mind. Let's get the circus tent pitched. We're very understaffed for this shit and don't have nearly enough pediatric surgeons on a good day. I sighed deeply and ran the numbers in my head. Looks like a couple of interns are about to experience their first solo procedures. He nodded, turned, and raced down the hallway. I knew, of course, where this road was headed, and I was determined that this time would be different. My mind was still reeling from the fact that my life had completely turned upside down, but I pushed the thoughts to the recesses of my mind. That ability is crucial in a hospital. I had a bus full of dying children to think about. I needed to be confident in the abilities of Dr. Vivian Scrit. I didn't know whether that confidence came from the outside world or if I generated it myself and put it out for all to see. I was pretty sure that both opposing ideas were true at the same time, and that simply believing made the idea real enough to have faith in it. My head spun. I shouted at the surgical team. We don't have enough operating rooms in the pediatric surgical unit. These kids don't have enough doctors for everyone to get a surgeon, and I don't have enough patients to put up with any donkey shit. I'm Dr. Scrit, and you work for me now. Dr. Matthews, how many surgeons do we have ready to go? His head jerked to attention like it was caught in a fishing line, and I felt a surge of strength at the fear I could feel radiating from him. Nine, um, and ten if you take a patient yourself, Miss, um, Dr. Scrit. He cleared his throat. <clears> throat> I've got four nurses scrambling to make calls, but it's not looking good. Most of the streets are completely flooded, and everyone who's attempted to drive here has gotten stranded. We tried contacting everyone we can, but the storm knocked the landline phones out, and it's crippling our cell reception. We're admittedly caught off guard. It's really a freak storm for August. Well, I don't- I stopped short. What's the date? I whispered to him. It's Thursday. I mean, August 25th. Vertigo hit me so hard that it felt like my asshole was turning inside out. Excuse me. I dashed out of the room and headed down the hallway. Before I could make it back into my own office, I dove into a familiar janitor's closet. I wanted to cry, but I was shaking too much. I looked down at my watch. My childhood home was going to burn down in an hour. My brother was still alive. Thoughts flitted independently across my brain like fifteen border collies on crack. They need me now. Timmy needs me now. The landlines are out. I'm needed in surgery. Someone is going to die. It is going to be my fault. You have five seconds to keep shaking and feeling sorry for yourself before you go out the door and decide whose life changes forever. I didn't think I could do it. Then I opened the door and walked outside. Dr. Matthews, it seems we're at least two surgeons short. How can you help me out? He looked at me steadily, but still with a hint of fear. I fed on it. Well, it's not ideal, but I think we'll have to put some interns on solo procedures. He winced. My stomach turned to clay. Who do you have in mind? Doctors um, Yankston and Branning have been doing very well. I closed my eyes. Who else do you have? He wouldn't speak until I looked straight at him. Dr. Scrit. I don't know how they do things where where you come from, but it's not customary for first-year interns to- Desperate shitty times call for desperate shitty measures, Doctor. Who else do you have? His face grew ashen. No one that I could, in good conscience, trust with the life of a child. I was about to cry. There was no stopping it. Then the doors burst open, and everything changed. Game time. Orders fired from my mouth before thought could form. Everyone followed what I told them to do. Get me a phone! I shouted to one nurse. I looked down seconds later to find I'd been given one. Dr. Scrit, there are three more patients awaiting an OR. I grabbed Dr. Matthews' arm. What are the simplest procedures that these kids need right now? He swallowed. It looks like a deep leg laceration on a male, ten years old, and an abdominal laceration on a female, also ten. No signs of damage to any major organs. I'm going to take one of those patients, pair Tweedledee and Tweedledum with the other, and keep them close enough to- Dr. Scrit, three other children are in cardiac arrest. Are you really going to- I need to make a phone call. You're needed in surgery. I'm the fucking chief of medicine. B, 
Because you're the one who's supposed to make the hardest decisions. I froze. The tears were waiting, but there simply wasn't time to cry. It was amazing what happens to impossible when there just isn't space for it. Get Yangston and Braining on the easy cases, I commanded, and prep a third patient for me in an operating room with them. I want an eye on as many surgeries as possible. I turned around to face a nurse at the desk, then scribbled a phone number on a sheet of paper. Call this house. Tell them to get everyone out to safety. She physically drew back in fear. All of our landlines are down, doctor. Well, since I'm fresh out of carrier pigeons, use a cell phone! She fought back tears. God damn, it was annoying me. I, I can't. Why not? Because I gave you mine. I'm sorry. My eyes bulged. Well, does no one else at the desk have one? What is this, 2006? She winced. Not yet. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Not wanting to look stupid, I stared her down like this was her fault. Then I raced into surgery. Does anyone have a cell phone that actually gets reception? I snapped at Dr. Matthews as we both ran down the hall. No. He gasped as he fell behind me. It looks like the storm has completely cut off all cell reception. I didn't have time to ponder whether a satellite phone existed anywhere in this godforsaken hospital. I was stitching up some kid's abdomen, staring at my watch and glancing across the OR at Braining and Yangston. Compartmentalize. I'm finished here. Nurse, take this kid to recovery. I have to make a phone- Patient's coding! The voice came from the far end of the room. Surprisingly, it was neither Braining nor Yangston, but a young resident that I knew would not endure into my original timeline. I raced across the OR to find the doctor was frozen in place. I I'm sorry. She mumbled through her surgical mask. I saw something in the closet. My mind isn't- Able to realize that you've left forceps inside of a patient's arm? I shouted. When she didn't move, I dove in. Though it had been difficult at the time, I'd faced the same hospital ghost this woman couldn't handle. Nothing in front of them was impossible. But she had chosen to believe that as an excuse to herself. This is why I have no patience with people. But even when she had stabilized, the patient's temperature was abnormally high. I also noticed how swollen her abdomen appeared. This is why I'm such a good doctor. Seconds later, I was doing a damn good job of removing the girl's burst appendix, able to glance up at Braining and Yangston, but unable to do anything to help them. Those numbers are fine for an adult. Is this your first time working on a child? We performed the hemogram test, and you didn't even check the results. Yangston's face turned bright red against the white surgical mask. You need to get the hell out of my OR, nurse! Your patient's coding! Now! Fuck. It was happening. My own patient's appendix was in a bad state, but I'd nearly finished. What? What happened? The scalpel shook in my hands. I could see the crash cart from the corner of my eye, recognizing an ID number of 8251913. As I knew I would. You cut his splenic artery, doctor. Alt responded flatly. I'm sorry. My hands are shaking. I'm so sorry. I hate church. How do we even know that God is real? My father ran his fingers through his thinning hair. His nails were dirty. They were always dirty. Going to church makes your pregnant mother stop nagging me for a whole hour each week, and that's all the proof of the divine I need. He sighed as he plopped onto the couch next to me. I didn't understand what he meant, so I kept the scowl etched deeply into my face. I flinched when he tried to hug me. Daddy cleared his throat. I didn't go to college like your mom did, so I never learned the best ways to convince people that they're wrong. He shook his head slowly. I don't know if adults understand church any more than six-year-olds like you do, Ellie, but many adults are old enough and wise enough to know when we should stop thinking and just go along with things. I kept my head turned away to show that he wasn't winning me over. I could hear him scratching his scalp in frustration. Okay. He continued, exasperated. I'll give you my best answer about church. And then you have to put your shoes on and just go out the door with me, because that's the best you're getting. Do you understand? I huffed. I don't. It's impossible for me to give a reason why we should believe in God, Ellie. It seems like so many things in life are unfair, but here's the thing. 
He put a great arm around me and pulled me close. You and I are here, aren't we? Well, what guarantee did we have of that? Where was the proof that my spirit and your spirit would be together, or even exist at all? Yet it happened, somehow. God believed in us before we were us, and two souls existed where there was nothing at all before. So I don't think it's about us believing in God, not at first. God believed in us, and we're responding to that with everything in our lives. I didn't understand his reasoning, but I felt his vulnerability, and I relaxed into his hug. Your mom says that every action has a reaction, but I think it's backwards. At least with church stuff, every reaction leads to an action. Did you know there's a prayer about it? I shook my head, pigtails bouncing. The prayer says that in giving, we receive, in pardoning, we are pardoned, and in dying, we are born. I finally turned around to look at him. How can we be born by dying? Isn't dying the end of all things? His face moved around in funny ways that I did not understand. I don't think dying is the end. Did you know that every single person you've ever met is changed because of you? And everyone they meet is different because of them. The entire world exists in just this way, at this moment, because of everyone who ever lived and died. Remember what I told you about those trees in West Texas? You don't stop affecting people after death, Ellie. I squirmed. So all dead people are ghosts that stay with us for the rest of our lives? My little Ellie Bean, I don't see any other explanation. I stared up at him with the kind of awe that only a child can have for their parent. So who taught us to talk backwards to God? Where did that prayer come from? He furrowed his eyebrows and scratched his chin. I believe, Ellie, that is called the Prayer of St. Francis. I could feel my mind breaking when my patient started coding. She was the only one that time hadn't promised to take from me, and apparently that hope existed just to string me along. I breathed deeply, stopped trying to understand time itself, and focused on what was causing this girl's heart to fail. She was losing more blood than made sense for an appendectomy. What was wrong? The forceps. The damn resident must have damaged her arm during his panic procedure, and now she was hemorrhaging, possibly from a brachial artery. She was bleeding from two places at once, and it would take a miracle to manage both issues at the same time. Since I didn't believe in miracles, though, I'd have to rely on myself. And I'm a damn good doctor. I was stitching her up just in time to settle back into the outside world. Dr. Yangston was staring in frozen shock at the dead child below him, while a nurse held Dr. Braining steady as he sobbed over his own failure. Below me, the girl's heart monitor beat steadily. You have to give yourself room for forgiveness, Dr. Braining. Tell me that you hear me. He rolled his red-rimmed eyes all over the hallway, looking at everything but me. Tell me that you hear me. It's a simple request mastered by children who have yet to figure out fine art of toilet usage. Dr. Braining! He slowly focused on me. I think I, I need to go be alone. He muttered distractedly. I knew how the story ended. I know you're in a bad place, but I cannot monitor you every second. You need to take responsibility for self-care first, Dr. Braining. You need to avoid being alone for the next day. He finally found my eyes. You're right, Dr. Skrit. I'm responsible for myself. It's all on me, all of it. He deflated. You can't hold me back forever. Please, let me go. I wanted to shake him, scream at him, tell him that I knew what he was about to do. Most of all, I wanted to smack the shit out of him. But he was right. I couldn't hold him back forever. I checked his pockets for illicit pills, but found none. What more could I do? I had a phone call to make. Dr. Braining, I want you to remember something. I commanded with a note of finality. He looked at me forlornly. If you insist on being so damn melancholy over things you can't change, then step up and take responsibility for the things that you can. Then, I turned and ran. I pulled out the cell phone and attempted to dial while moving at top speed. The call went through, and no one picked up. You've reached the Avela's home, but we're gone. 
I screeched to a halt in front of a familiar-looking janitor emerging from a well-used closet. He held up a gentle hand with dirty fingernails, indicating that I needed to stop. I obeyed. He smiled sadly. If you'd run into Huntington Bank across the street, you could have used their phone in time. But I'm sorry, it's too late. Your house is burned to the ground. I turned and walked dazedly away. The last 26 years of my life had been taken from me just to have this moment. And I'd wasted it. No, that wasn't true. The entire rest of my life had been taken away because it would be totally impossible to pick up the thread of my old life by the time I finally arrived back in 2031. Everything in my life had been burned away in that damn fire, just like it had for Timmy. It was too much. I was breaking. I turned around, dove into that janitor's closet, and completely fucking lost it. I didn't care if anyone heard. I just wanted to know that no one could touch me and that I would be completely alone as I finally broke and ugly cried my hope away. I had no desire to live after this moment. The concept of existing was too painful. Everything was over. I wanted my story to end. Eventually, though, I stopped crying. I was actually surprised to realize that the story kept going. I was so focused on where and when I was that my imagination simply couldn't conceive of an after, so I had assumed that there was none. Time, it seems, did not care for what I thought. So with nothing else in my script, I stood up, walked out the door, and continued to be the chief of medicine. Your doctors suck ass, the little girl explained as I checked her bandages. Your language sucks ass, young lady, I replied as I replaced the gauze. It was healing perfectly. I'd been the one who removed her appendix. Of course it was faultless. Why the hell did he leave forceps in me then? I'm only 12 years old. And even I know there was no reason to use that kind of equipment when my arm was just cut. I raised an eyebrow. Something about her frizzy hair, dark brown eyes, and edginess seemed so familiar. So you think you can do a better job in my operating room, kid? She shrugged. The bar's pretty low. I snorted. You survived a burst appendix. You're welcome. The girl nodded flippantly. Yeah, but that's your job. A better job would have been to notice the problem before it got so bad in the first place. I dropped my hands to my hips, exasperated. You think you've got this figured out? Yeah, she responded casually. Well, one day I will. You want to be a doctor? I shot back. Maybe, she answered, staring at her arm instead of me. But probably a nurse. Doctors are just nurses who get tired of having their hands dirty. I chuckled for the first time in recent memory, then looked down and read her chart once more. I stared back at her. Lydia? That's my name. The same information has been on your page this entire time. She responded. See, that's what I mean. You have to pay attention to what's happening before time runs out. I resolved to be kind to myself when she appeared in 2019. Young Ellie had been through a lot. I saw her for the first time when she was eating lunch with the other new recruits. I had thought the moment would be a transcendental experience, but all I could focus on was how badly I missed being able to glide across the room without cracking my hips. She sat down next to Dr. Myron Caldwell, who quickly grabbed her sandwich, took a bite, and placed it out of reach. Ellie's face fell. Then she stood up, walked around the table, and picked up her own food. Dr. Caldwell called over Dr. Hassenfuss, who was easily the most attractive of the new class, and motioned for her to sit beside him. Ellie turned around to find that her seat had been taken. She wiped her eye, then sat down at a different table to finish her sandwich. Entirely alone. My stomach dropped. What a fucking wuss. I'd entirely forgotten about that moment and felt as though I was watching a stranger. Was this really the class of 2019? I'd worked wonders with idiots before, but there was a limit. Even for doctors as good as me. How was I supposed to inspire this class? I can mold clay, but I can't mold shit. And what was I going to do with Ellie? I don't have time to get to know you, I explained to the assembled group. 
So make yourself stand out in some noteworthy way, and I won't have to stress about it. See, I can be warm and supportive. I looked around at my noble crew. Dr. Falhar had an entire knuckle up his nostril. Dr. Brutson was chuckling to himself and ignoring me. And Dr. Caldwell reached out to pinch Dr. Hassenfuss's ass. She squeaked, turned red, and grinned at him. For fuck's sake. We had just come out of pediatric surgery, and the slapdick squad was acting like the job stopped when they clocked out. I huffed. These folks, and the patients they were half a suture away from killing, were lucky to have my nurturing guidance. Nineteen of you start today, and we've got a pool going with bets on how long each of you will last. I stifled a grin as I looked over at my shock charges, snorted, then turned and walked away. They hesitated. My stomach dropped as I realized they had no sense of respect. God damn. Things needed to improve quickly. You should know when to follow me and when to stay away, because I'm not going to waste time explaining what you should figure out on your own. They quickly caught up. As we rounded a corner, I turned to see Ellie getting elbowed to the back of the line. She accepted the abuse willingly. It was very clear that she was not close to any path that led to being the chief of medicine. She barely looked able to handle being a doctor. St. Francis was going to crush this weak little butterfly by week's end. My hand shook. Was this girl going to disrupt space-time because she couldn't deal with human interaction? My mind was racing. I never played favorites, but the years at St. Francis had taught me to accept whatever message the hospital was sending my way. It expects things from me, but gave me tools in return. I just hadn't thought about how badly I would need them on day one. Hell, the list of rules phenomenon was something I didn't even think about until a few people had dropped out. On some random day each year, a mysterious stack of papers would show up on my desk. I knew not to look at them. I would simply gather them up and hand them out, knowing that each list would manifest itself to the right person. I'd nearly forgotten that they'd showed up so soon in 2019. But in that moment, as I was walking down the hallway, I felt my pockets suddenly grow heavy with a stack of paper. Wordlessly, I grabbed the sheets and sent them behind me. Take one and pass it back, Dr. Indleman. I commanded offhandedly. I gave the group a moment to send them back, knowing that Ellie would be the lone person to be denied a paper, because she was the last in line, and because she was a wuss. You should have the list of expectations for St. Francis. I explained as I walked on, not needing to glance behind me to know that Ellie would be panicking. I printed 18 sets of rules so that you would have to challenge one another for them, knowing that one of you would get left behind. It was harsh, even for me, but I knew what Ellie was capable of, so I had to bitch slap the weakness out of her right now. If you cannot follow these rules, there will be no place for you in this hospital. It most likely means that you are unsuited to be a doctor and should consider a profession that demands a weaker mental aptitude. I stopped and turned around as though I was interested in the group but only needed to watch Ellie. I'd observed the rest long ago, and the person we see least is ourselves. I saw sadness in her. One more tiny crack emerged in the kaleidoscope of fissures that spiderwebbed across my mind as I felt Timmy residing subconsciously in the back of her thoughts. Compartmentalize. And if you think that I'm the type to give second chances after a mistake, you're woefully underprepared for the world of medicine. I looked at each one in turn hoping that my lesson had landed. Ellie still looked petrified. Dr. Falhar was still spelunking for that stubborn booger. Why do so many slapdicks want to be professionals? Shoveling elephant poop at the zoo is a perfectly necessary profession, and life would be so much easier if people had the decency to be honest about the future they planned for themselves. I waited for them to show some sort of initiative. Caldwell, though a douche, had at least been top 10 in his class at John Hopkins. Were all of them going to stare at me in mindless nihilism? Behind me, several unattended heart rate monitors beeped for attention. Well, I shot out in exasperation. Why are you all standing here? People are dying. Get to work! I didn't feel bad when Dr. Caldwell screamed. The hospital had simply purged one person in exchange for sparing those who he would have killed in the years ahead due to his inadequacy. I watched the scene unfold from across the hall. Dr. Matthews looked terrified as he raced into the room, but the familiar janitor nodded calmly as he swept past me and closed the door behind him. 
Dr. Caldwell was going to die. Many years ago, my mind had learned to accept what it could not change. My heart was slower to adapt, but it became more calloused every day. I didn't follow the janitor as he opened the door and whisked Dr. Caldwell away on a gurney. Instead, I focused my efforts on Ellie as she walked out of the room a few moments later, thinking that she was being subtle. Of course, her bright red face was about as subtle as a sledgehammer to the testicles. She was way, way outside her comfort zone. I smiled. Time travel is the most baffling thing, until it's replaced by an even stranger reality. You learn to accept it, as people learn to accept all everyday miracles, until the fantastic so thoroughly pervades our lives that it finally becomes mundane. Humans did the exact same thing the day after the airplane, the rocket ship, and the smartphone were finally unleashed upon the unsuspecting species. They got up and went to work, just like every other day. And so did I. And so did the younger version of myself. At least she'd been trying to seem like she'd been working before I found her hiding in the closet, reading a list of stolen rules and looking guiltier than a teenage boy who'd been caught fucking a stuffed teddy bear. Dr. Phelis, I interrupted, barely hiding my grin. I'm shocked. I stared down at the bloodstained list of rules in her hands. Her mouth flapped around, but in her fear, she was unable to master the voice-to-words concept. You took a list that wasn't yours and were nowhere to be found after your co-worker experienced such an unnatural incident. I huffed through my nose. It seems you're willing to do the unthinkable in the name of getting what you need, and Myron couldn't even follow the most important rule. She clenched her teeth. I had my four-year streak of predicting which incoming doctors will break the soonest. This will ruin my chances in the office pool. She brought the story, because it was a very easy lie to her, and I had to turn around before she saw me break into a full smile. Get to work, doctor. You've got three hours left on your shift, and those symptoms aren't going to Google themselves. I learned early on that surgery hurts, but it heals. This poor girl was plagued by a paralyzing case of self-doubt, and there was no anesthesia that could be applied during its removal, but that girl needed all the confidence she could get if she wanted to survive the years ahead, and I cared too much to hold myself back the best treatment, even if the short-term cost felt scary. I considered our little conversation to be a win. Besides, she would get over it. I was certain. Years passed. Each day, I hurt a little more, because I can't stop thinking what I would do if I could go back, and I know that I would probably still make the same choice. That was the moment I could feel one of the largest remaining pieces of my charged heart fissure and fall away. I turned aside, because I could not afford to let her see my brokenness. Not now. Not after everything. Ellie... Why do you think that St. Francis Hospital would have such an arbitrary set of rules for its interns? The rules come from somewhere beyond us. I understand that now. We're just here to follow them. This girl had come a long way. I was the one now half a breath from tears. I shook my head as a distraction. No, Dr. Phelis, that isn't true. What was the first rule? Never, under any circumstances, share your copy of the rules with anyone else. Calm and focused once more, I stared at her and raised an eyebrow. And how does that make any sense? A swell of smugness rose up as I watched her stumble. Y you it was important to see not all of us were going to make it. That much is true, I answered dismissively. We've seen more than enough evidence of that tonight. But you're wrong about the rule coming from somewhere else. I bore my eyes into her. She was speechless. I don't understand. Then you're starting to get it. I shot back, regaining my arrogant groove. You weren't top of your class, Dr. Ophelis. Not even close. But you're at least smart enough to be a doctor. Can you attempt to figure this out? She said nothing. It was a calculated move, and I respected it. I shook my head to mask my pride in her. Then I made the leap. Did you really never make the connections, Dr. Phelis? The trial of jumping off a roof. Judgment from an authoritative janitor. 
multiple different rules about burning children, her jaw fell. The first rule prohibits the sharing of rules because no one has the same set. Each doctor is faced with his or her own list of restrictions and most aren't up to the challenge. Her mouth opened and closed three times before she could conjure a response. Every, every rule is just for me. I took off my glasses and bore my eyes into her. People think that this hospital wants to destroy them, when in reality, each person is given every tool needed for survival. I snorted. It's impossible to stop most individuals' desire to kill themselves. She attempted and failed to connect the dots. But rule four, why did it tell me not to touch your Reese's peanut butter cups? She almost figured it out. Almost. But still, I hid the truth. Because it's my favorite candy. She nodded slowly. Mine, too. I waited half a second longer, wondering if she finally grasped the truth and possibly break the cycle. But it was not to be. I put my glasses back on and revealed all that I could. You're going to ask what this place is. I've survived St. Francis far longer than most. That's why people expect me to tell them. I waited, choosing each of my next words very carefully. So before you say that you want me to tell you the truth, you should understand this fact. I stared her down until she was finally turning away from me again. It's important for me to have the upper hand. There are things that I can't know and things that I don't know. Embracing these ideas as a strength instead of a weakness is the reason I've endured where others have not. The silence meant that she only understood all of some of what I'd said, not some of it and only some of all of it. Such is the condition of being an enlightened physician. Can... can you see the individual rules on each doctor's paper? She asked, breaking the silence. I smiled. It was true that the other doctors had their own mysterious list of rules, but she still didn't get it. No, but I can see what's written on their faces, which is the same thing. I don't get it. She answered flatly. I sighed in disappointment, throwing her one more bone. Do you remember when I reminded you of Rule 9? Her mind whirled with the stupid brilliance of rote memorization. You told me the morgue needed 13 cadavers at all times. She answered confidently. No. I lied. You told me that. I acted like I had known the entire time, and you responded to my confidence. Each person's list of rules is their own battle to fight. To be blunt, I'd rather see the doctors fail themselves through inadequacy than see the patient suffer because someone was unable to live up to their own unearned arrogance. She blinked. I'd like to earn my arrogance. I like that answer. I liked it a lot. The good news is that I think you might have endurance to survive the unusually lengthy journey it would take for you to achieve earned arrogance. My heart broke with pride at the unseen path. Then the door burst open with an unplanned emergency that defines a physician's everyday schedule, and we moved on. She never asked how I knew that the trial of jumping off a roof, judgment from an authoritative janitor, or the extreme importance of burning children defined her life. She didn't question why I even knew what those rules were in the first place. The truth had been there in plain sight, but had gone unnoticed until the second time around. Had it really not been obvious? The next big change was coming soon. It infused my thoughts like damp air whispering of a coming storm. I thought I was ready for it, which proved that some lessons are never learned. I had been quietly following Ellie through the same hallway that had drawn me in years earlier. On this particular day, though, she only noticed a familiar janitor haunting its walls. We'd both seen him periodically throughout the years, rarely talking and never aging. This time, however, he looked right at her and spoke. It's time to make a choice, Ellie. He explained softly. The most successful people are often seen as a breed apart, achieving lofty heights because they're built of different stuff. Dr. Ophelis disproved this by dampening her pants as possibly the greatest moment of her life began to unfold. She didn't think she was quite ready to be chief of medicine, which meant that it was time to start. The janitor turned aside and looked toward a space in the wall that had only occasionally held a physical door. 
It stood there now, slightly ajar. The numbers were etched deeply into the wood, warped and worn like they had been there for years. Why does it say 3191? She asked. He smiled sadly. It's your opportunity to go backwards. She was weak, which meant it was the moment with her greatest chance to achieve strength. Where does it lead? She asked in a shaking voice. Rural Missouri. He continued inexorably. Far from any town, about 30 minutes away from Driskin. He raised his eyebrows. But that's not the real question now, is it? She shut her eyes. When does it lead? He waited until she was strong enough for eye contact before he continued. August 25th, 2005. She started to cry. Can it go any earlier? No. He responded sharply. I'd have very little time to prepare. The world turns on what people do with very little. She wiped her eyes, deciding if she was going to be strong or weak. Okay. She responded, voice shaking. I need to go back. I can be ready in a few days. Where will I find the door? The janitor stood very still. Right here. Right now. She flirted with weakness. No, 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 no. I I'm not ready right this second. I need to prepare if my life is going to change. She was losing the battle for herself and had already been defeated in the don't look like a mucusy mess competition. He folded his hands firmly. If you don't go now, the door disappears. You'll never see it again. She fell into a kneeling position. Though certain that she was ready to take over as chief of medicine, I was unimpressed in this moment. Okay. She whimpered. Okay, I'll go now. When I come back, will the world be different? He was very quiet. Then... You can only go back the hard way, Ellie. That's when I first became aware of the tears covering my own face. That was 26 years ago. I, I can't lose that much of my life. He sighed. Yes, you can. People lose that much every day. I covered my mouth to hide the sobs. Well, I don't understand. Is my body going to reverse in age or will I just look like this and die 26 years earlier? I heaved, overpowered by great, silent crying, barely able to keep quiet. You don't get any extra time, Ellie. He continued in his commanding voice. Any year that you live twice takes away from what would have been. He looked over at me, making direct eye contact for the first time. He seemed absolutely demanding of obedience. But he didn't let her know I was there. She dry heaved. But, but will it be like the last time I went back? Or will I be able to change things now? He smiled. I couldn't tell if the expression was sad because it was happy, or happy because it was sad. The past will be yours to change as you decide. The world will be different as a result of your choices. She looked up, suddenly quite confident. I melted to the floor. Ellie. He pressed. You always knew that last part was true, right? She finally sobbed, loudly. I took the opportunity to let my own cries overlap hers. For just a moment, they matched up perfectly. She leaned forward, pressing her hands onto the ground. I need time to process this. You don't have time, and you don't need it. Right now, you have to step through that door or walk away forever. He reached out, grabbed the knob, and began to pull it shut. We like to pretend that grave decisions take time because it allows us to believe that deep thought changes our basis instincts but we are our truest selves in short moments of high consequence. She leapt up and squeezed through the door just as he closed it behind her. And when he immediately pulled it open again, there was no one on the other side. We were alone. For the first time in 26 years, there weren't two of me in the world, running parallel tracks on a journey that was neither predetermined nor authored by our choices. You almost broke the moment. He said while staring at the wooden frame. Then he turned to face me. She was the stronger one today. I looked up at him, the end of the story at hand. I wondered if I had really believed that the final scene was going to be more glorious than this. It doesn't matter, I huffed. It's done now. I looked away, wiped the tears and snot on my wrist, 
and walk past him. It does matter, Ellie, and it's never done. I was glad to be facing away from him as I discovered that there were still tears left in reserve. Every person you failed and every person you saved don't get to walk away from what you did here each day for 26 years. I attempted, unsuccessfully, to sniff all the snot up from my upper lip back into my nose. <sighs> well, my story can be done, for better or worse or whatever. Is that the side of the door you're choosing? There was a hint of something in his voice that I could not place. It stirred something between hope and fear in my chest, and I did not like the feeling. Slowly, I turned around to look at him. The door was still ajar. Where does that door- Not the right question. When does that door- Please, don't ask questions to which you already know the answers. The space between us froze with a crystalline energy that was both gorgeous and deadly. I'm an old woman. My story is finished. He shook his head. Stories don't finish. He continued, lips pressed together. Not when there are people still living the effects of what's been written and unwritten. When I spoke again, my voice was very brittle, as though ready to splinter along its weakest edges. I tried to fight time. It took my whole life. I took in a deep, trembling breath. I have nothing left to show for it. You have your whole life to show for it. He responded firmly. Every day will be lived, whether you spend that in regret or happiness has no bearing on the passage of time. As long as you are still breathing, it is impossible for a past decision to take your life. Another frozen moment came, and then it passed. I'm 64 years old. I responded wearily. It's time for me to retire. I turned away from the janitor and the door and I walked. Wait. I stopped, but did not turn back. You didn't close the door. I remained facing away from him. There isn't always a strong choice and a weak choice. Sometimes simply making a decision is a sign of strength. Well then? He responded with a hint of desperation. I paused. Then I walked away from room 3191 but did not close the door behind me and headed down the hall to a place where I suspected that I was needed. Emergencies had a way of finding me. If you don't let the past go, then the past will never let go of you. Hello everyone. I have had an influx of new subscribers recently, so you might be confused as to what this is. And what it is, is my book club. I like to come in at the end of long series and things like that where I feel like there's a lot to be said that I can't just mention in my pinned comment, and talk about my thoughts, what it was like to make it, what I was thinking about certain aspects of the story, sound design, and stuff like that and I just have a little chat, and it's been dubbed by me and my loving subscribers as Rom's Book Club. So gather round. If you're interested in this sort of thing, I'm gonna be kind of picking apart the story, going over some of the themes, how I made the story, what the struggles were, and things like that. If not, the story's finished, so you can click away now. This story, I very greatly enjoyed. I loved almost every moment of it. Some of it struck me in a way that pulled at my emotions in a way I didn't expect, but other than that, 
I really did have a fantastic time with this story. Some stories drag on for me, but this one was very long. It was 15 parts, which I put into five videos. And even though it was so long, it didn't exactly become old for me, kind of like the Social Worker series did. But they were still good stories, it's just, this story did not drag for me in any way. It was pretty fast paced, but in a way that I very much so enjoyed. When I got to the part of the story where it suddenly became apparent that the whole time the main character and Dr. Skrit are the same person, I very greatly started to doubt whether or not I had done the story right. When I started the story, I had read about seven of the parts, and I was like, wow, I'm seven parts in, that's pretty far, and I really like it, and so I went ahead and got permission to do it. Sometimes this can really come back to bite you, and thankfully, I don't think it really bit me that much, because the only thing I really had to be concerned about was that I voice acted them so differently. Being that Dr. Skrit, I gave a southern accent. I tried to give her an Appalachian accent because it's where the story takes place and also where I'm from. I'm not sure how well I did because I don't have a very thick accent, but I at least think it made her sound interesting and a lot of people seem to actually like how she sounded. So I don't regret doing that. And another reason I don't regret doing that, even though they're the same person, is that you'd be able to figure that out way too soon. I think that it was a really impactful twist, and I personally did not see it coming until it was pretty much happening. Let me know if you saw it coming, because I feel like it was done in a really good way, personally. And I love stories like that. I've always been a huge fan of time travel stories, Things like Doctor Who, I've always loved that show. So this story really became just better and better for me as I went on. I think that I got away personally with having the accent on Skrit because she had to try to differentiate herself somehow. Because if you'll notice in the story, there is some sort of unspoken, you can't tell your younger self that you're her. For some reason, that's like a rule that can't be broken. Otherwise, this loop, this time loop that they're stuck in, reliving over and over, wouldn't exist, right? So, I at least think that it makes sense. And I am glad that I chose to do the accent. With that being said, I hope that my intention came across in the last part, after we realized the time thing in the beginning, how it's a loop, the rest of the story, I decided to voice act so that when the main character, Ellie, was pretending to be Dr. Skrit, because Dr. Skrit is a persona that she came up with in this, within this time loop, you know, it's all paradoxical and it's not exactly clear, but as far as time travel goes, she came up with Dr. Skrit so that she wasn't just running around like, I'm Ellie Aphelis, blah, and so that she couldn't come to realize that that was her. So I try to make it sound like sometimes it really is just an act. In the beginning of when she realizes she's Dr. Skrit, she has no accent. And then whenever she speaks out loud to other people who know her as Dr. Skrit in the past, she will use her accent. And so I try to make it very apparent that she was coming into playing this character and I'd like to know in the comments if some of you will let me know if that came across. Because I do realize that it might have just sounded like sometimes I forgot to speak with the accent, but I really did try to be very precise and deliberate with where I put the accent. Sometimes when she was lost in her thoughts, even after she'd become Dr. Skrit, I tried to make it apparent that she was just losing how much she knew she needed to act like Dr. Skrit by not using the accent and vice versa. And then eventually, when she got much older and she'd been acting like Dr. Skrit for so long, the accent was almost always there because she'd gotten so used to it. I really want to know if that part of the story made sense. Because everything else, I feel like, wasn't hard to work around with the time travel. 
it did take quite a long time to go back and get all those different parts to put in because there are several scenes that are redone, but from Dr. Skrit's point of view. And that took some time, but other than that, it wasn't that bad. I really like, by the way, that the author did that. It was really cool to see this cold, heartless person that had been so mean to the main character up until this part were suddenly able to see what she thought all those times she was being such a bitch. We're finally able to see how sometimes she was actually herself really suffering. I think that if it wasn't for the time loop, Dr. Skrit would not have been a very fleshed out character. I think that she would have just been the stereotypical bitch character. But after all of that crazy development, I really have come to like the main character, even though I was kind of in the boat that a lot of other people were in at first, where she's kind of an asshole. And I guess I'll address now why I think a lot of people thought that. So please correct me in the comments if this is not what you were thinking, but I was thinking in the part where we learn that it is her fault that her brother died in a fire. While I was acting that out, I was thinking, when I was 12 years old, I would definitely know better than this. I just, I remember what I was like when I was 12, cause she was 12 when that happened. And I absolutely had the brain power to not do something stupid like that. I know it was like, oh, she was so upset. She was so mad, she, she didn't mean it. But still, I, I feel like that part would have been more impactful and less of a main character deterrent, you know, like people wouldn't dislike the main character so much if Ellie had been a little younger. That's really my only big nitpick with this whole story, is that that part, it's so easy to start hating the main character because she's definitely old enough to know better. And that's just my opinion. Let me know if, if that's why you came to dislike her as well. I did wrestle with whether or not I was going to share certain things in this book club because I knew I was gonna do one because I so badly wanted to talk about how cool I thought that twist was and I wanted to put my opinions about it out there. But also, one of the things that made this story a little hard for me to do around the middle is it hit too close to home. I'm going to share some personal stuff now that has to do with, like, that ties into the story a little bit. So if, you know, if you're not interested in that, you know, click away, I guess. But I have always been really stricken by the responses I get from people that have lost loved ones on my stories, because I have a large amount of stories that are about parents losing their children because, you know, with me being a female narrator, it just so happens that a lot of the stories for women are about mothers losing their sons and daughters. And I can't even fully describe what it feels like for someone to be in the comments talking about how they lost their son or daughter, their loved one, their wife, their husband, I can't believe that I have the privilege of these people coming to me and being like, your story was so good, it made me cry. And sometimes it it's not a privilege and it's more of a, I'm so sorry that happened to you and I just mostly hope that I didn't trigger you in any way. So it's two sides of the same coin because on one hand I feel really flattered that they'll comment and tell me how much my story touched them. And then I'll feel like absolute crap because I just hope that they're doing okay. And so this ties in because I have been greatly avoiding doing stories that have to do with siblings dying because I lost my brother when I was 12, actually. So the story it hit too close to home. When I was 12 years old, 
my big brother died in a car accident. And even though it's not anywhere near the same situation, I'm sure you'll understand if you've lost someone that the reminder is just enough, you know? And when I was recording that part, it, it was a crazy coincidence to me because on March 31st was the nine year anniversary of my brother's death. And the first, so the day after that, was the seven year anniversary of my stepdad. And I recorded the, that part with the fire on the first. So I was like, really? <laughs> Of course, this, uh, this is when this would happen, when I would be recording this part. So it was very emotional for me. And I mean, that's good and bad. Good because I really was crying when I was recording that part. You know, the part, part where the sister is screaming up to the balcony, telling her brother to jump. I was actually almost crying, you know, and, uh, Good because authentic experience, but, you know, bad because it made me really sad. <laughs> so, this story really did get me in some parts. And that's about all I wanted to say about it. I really liked this story. I'm really thankful I got to narrate it. I think that the author was very nice to let me narrate it with just a book plug in it. You know, because I have plugged their book in every part. Because usually, when an author's coming out with a book, it's just a hard no. Because they'll have a contract written up with a company, or maybe it's so popular that another narrator has paid them to not let anyone else narrate it. It could be all kinds of things. But the author was sweet enough to let me do the story, you know, with just plugging to the book. And I'm very thankful for that. And I don't think they'll ever hear this, but... If they do, I just want you to know that I am very, very thankful that you let me do this story. I hope you all enjoyed it too, listeners. And I would love to know what you thought about it in the comments. I read every comment, even if I don't reply to them all. I sometimes just can't think of a good reply, but I do my best. So let me know what you thought, if you have any nitpicks, if anything didn't make sense. And I hope you have a beautiful day.